first year we fished, uh, we caught a 442-pound blue marlin on day one of the Bisbees. We, uh, and we weighed that fish. We caught it on a lure right in front of the harbor. Uh, uh, but we ended up getting beat for the daily by, by a guy with like a 500-pound black marlin. Ah, so we almost, we almost made our million dollars, year one. But, oh, man, it was sad, right? And I'm like, God, we, 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 would get, we came so close. It's very rare to weigh a fish in the Bisbees. The Bisbees are not good fishing tournaments for, for numbers, right? Very rare to weigh fish into Bisbee. So it seems like this once in a lifetime deal. So it was kind of a bummer. We didn't win the million dollars, but we got fifth place. And we got our little novelty check and we, and we got our little trophy. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is great. And how did it start out? Like, what was the origin of the story? Too much alcohol. Really? Okay. Because <laughs> if God wanted us to have fiberglass boats, he would have given us fiberglass trees. It's, it's for fishermen. It's not for taking the wife and the wife's friends. It's, I think that it's a really, really pretty bit. And then there was a blur that went by and ended up in the cockpit as yeah. far as if I can remember uh-huh. correctly. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to the State of Sport Fishing Podcast. I'm Nick Carullo, captain of the Showtime, and I'm joined by Anthony Pino with Hooked Optics and captain of the Blood Money. We meet every Tuesday, and we're joined by a captain mate, boat builder, or owner in the sport fishing industry. Uh, before I welcome our guest, uh, I'd like to say we don't run ads, so if you could share this podcast with a friend, we'd greatly appreciate it. With that said, let's welcome our guest. Evan Salve, uh, captain of the Stella June out in Cabo in Southern California. Uh, thanks for joining us, Evan. All right. Happy to be here. What's up, guys? How's it going? What's, what's going on, bro? What's Just going on in your world out there? Just another beautiful day. We got very nice, beautiful year-round weather down here in Cabo, so we're enjoying it. Beautiful day, fall, late fall, going into early winter. So Nice, bro. We're hanging out down here in San Jose. Awesome. Do you spend most of your time in Cabo, Evan, or do you, do you, I mean, I know that you're, do you go back and forth to California do you, and fish in there in California in the summer? So, um, or, both, yeah. both, both California and Cabo, you know, have full bona fide year round sport fisheries. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think a lot of the fishing programs here on the West coast kind of follow a general routine, which is that they'll usually fish, you know, most of the spring and summer back up in California and then usually move their programs south to Cabo, you know, in the, in the late summer, early fall, you know, between September and October. Uh, some guys will stick through, you know, the spring and early summer out here. It does get pretty hot, you know, here in the middle of summer. So a lot of guys, you know, take refuge back in the more temperate California. Um, but nowadays, yeah, I mean, I'm down here pretty much uh, almost semi year round. You know, I spend time here every month of the year, but Usually, uh, our, the bulk of our season and our, and our concerted Cabo efforts happen, you know, between September and, say, June. And then we usually move, uh, move everything back north once the, the bluefin kind of approaches the border and, and, and tucks above the border in Southern California. And that's kind of like on its own migratory clock. But usually, uh, usually by, you know, late spring or early summer, it gets pretty consistent up there and, and provides really good opportunity really through now, you know, there's still, still, there's still fish being caught even into November, December, and even into the new year, some years, you know, in California, but the bulk of the, of the, of the heavy, you know, consistent bluefin fishing is happening, you know, through summer and and, and fall there. So, you know, we, we try to, we try to keep it pretty balanced. You know, there's, there's California's actually got one of the best fisheries on the planet right now. And it's a fishery that, that, that gets a certain amount of conversation around it, but probably not enough. Because I, I actually do believe that California's t- tuna fishery, its bluefin fishery, is probably the best, you know, fish by fish fishery, you know, in, in, in the country and perhaps the world. You know, maybe not seeing the extreme upper end of the spectrum that you see in the Northeast, you know, or, or, or other areas of the Atlantic. But you certainly see like probably the highest volume of 100 to 300 pound fish available to, you know, an angler or, or, or a crew that doesn't necessarily have to have a super high barrier of entry. To, to catch the fish, you know, the techniques and a lot of the fishing that's being done up there is fairly well established after, you know, the last six, six or so seasons, um, since we've seen this great resurgence in the bluefin fishery, it really came back in, in say 2014, 2015, but 2015 being, I'd say the year that we started to see like consistent volume of triple digit size fish, you know, w- within the SoCal bite. So over the last, you know, six years, I think there's been a lot of like regionally specific techniques that have developed there to catch this fish really, really, really effectively. And because we're dealing with volume that I think is extremely high uh, and very concentrated, you know, so when you get into the volume in these fisheries, I mean, you're, you're looking at, 
you know, thousands of tons of fish, you know, in, in relatively small areas. So it's very accessible and it's very catchable. And, and, and uh, it's a really fantastic, you know, tuna fishery, probably the best in the, in, in the States right now, you know, for that kind of fish. Um, so yeah, we, we, we put our time up there and then, you know, we come down here for, for, for the tournament season, you know, in the fall fish in the full Cabo tournament circuit. And then, and then fish stripe marlin and, 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 and tuna and sort of this year through the, through the winter, through spring, through, through pretty much the, the entire remainder of the season. You know, we give it our, we give it our month fishing black marlin. We fish black marlin for a couple months, really nice. just September, October, November. And then, and then it's stripey fishing and, 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 and tuna fishing and, and, and other stuff, you know? So it's a pretty sick. full spectrum program and most boats kind of yeah. emulate that. that <clears throat> that's sick. Yeah. I mean like a bluefin fisheries, that's, it's pretty special. What's a, what's a good day look like out there for that? So, I mean, it, it, it varies based on, on kind of where we are in the season, but it's, it's fairly common for us to catch, uh, you know, five, six, seven, uh, you know, fish over 150 pounds a day um, nice. with, with double digit numbers, definitely being a, a, a fairly common, not uncommon occurrence on a day-to-day basis. I mean, at this point, I'll, 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 I'll tell you kind of the routine, right? So you're going to wake up in the morning, you'll wake up and like, if I mean, I'm a day boat operation, I'll preface that. I, I do commercial fish bluefin. So, so we have a, a, but I do it on a center console. A lot of my friends, a lot of people do it on like traditional kind of East coast, wicked tuna style, down Easter style boats. Right. So, but we're doing it on a center console, which is skiff fishing, which is very true to my, to my origins, I guess. And so we'll leave, you know, we'll leave it at the crack of dawn. Uh, Sometimes we only got to run 30 miles. Sometimes we have to run a hundred miles. It's a very broad swath of water. And that's one of the things about California that's very different than say Florida is it's very layered, right? So when you're in Florida, you have like you have your drop off, right? And and most of the activity that you have is going to be centered within those few miles of shore, right? So you have that, that highway and whether it's sail fishing or king fishing, or, or you go to the edge of that for swordfish, you fish the beach of that for your sails, like you fish, but you're fishing within a a relatively narrow swath of water for most of your, you know, concerted activities in California, that swath and that highway can be a hundred miles wide, right? So you have like multiple, multiple layers of ridges and banks and in, 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 in areas where this fish can, can, can run and, and, and can, can be active. Right. So it very much depends on the season. You know, sometimes we only have to run 10 miles off the beach. Sometimes it's only five miles off the beach. And then, you know, there's other times where we have to do 120 miles, you know, on a small boat one way just to kind of touch it, you know? Um, so we'll, we'll get out there and, you know, most of the fishing we're doing right now, there, there's, say five dominant techniques that you can fish this stuff. And, and I might be missing that number might be, not be correct, but it just to put it roughly at that. So you have, you know, a, a bait fishery, which is, you know, uh, something that's practiced like very commonly amongst like the sport boats or, or your guys' head boats. Uh, and that's going to be like, Hey, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to pull up on a sonar school or, or we're going to run some fish over uh, or we're going to see a breeze or some sort of signal. And we're going to throw a, a lot of sardine at it. And you're going to have a bunch of guys you know, fly lining sardines essentially on, on, you know, a corresponding tackle for the grade of fish they're fishing. Uh, and you're going to catch fish that way on bait. So it's sardines, mackerel, you know, stuff like that. Uh, then you have like a, a, a lure fishery and we have a, California's got a, a, a really vibrant biomass and forage fish, right? With, with anchovy, squid, mackerel, sardines, the full spectrum, but you know, offshore, when they get on anchovy and they get on some of this, you know, offshore bait, you know, we, we have this incredible foamer fishing, which is, which is fish that are foaming. It's, it's active service fish, the same as you'll see anywhere in the world. So, so when that's the case, you have this really awesome lure fishery. So you can throw poppers and stick baits, surface irons, which is a a giant, a big spoon looking thing. That's very common on the West coast. So, so we'll fish that lure fishery for, for all different sizes of fish. Um, You have, kind of a jigging fishery, which is something that's usually done at night, like flat fall jigs, knife jigs, stuff like that. Done on the sport boats commonly because they can sit out there all night, you know, big operations that fish multiple days out there. So they'll fish all through the night and you'll catch, you know, two, 300 pound fish on the knife jigs on the flat fall jigs, sitting two, 300 feet of water down, heavy tackle in the middle of the night. Uh, then you have uh, kind of this kite fishing, which is really the bread and butter that I'd say, most of the operations that are doing really, really heavy volume from a private boat perspective are basing their programs around this kite fishery still. Um, and and the, the dominant way to do it is to take a, a frozen flying fish uh, or an artificial flying fish and, 
And in one of them is called the California flyer. You might've seen it kind of popping around the internet, but it's basically a, a big rubber flying fish um, that's photorealistic and profile realistic. And you deploy it from a kite and you're setting up on meter marks or setting up on breezers or setting up on sonar schools. And that, I mean, you'll just do incredible volume on that. It's, 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 they can't resist it. I mean, when the fish are in a biting demeanor, they just eat it really well, even when there's a lot of pressure. So there'll be, there'll be fisheries and, or there'll be, you know, days where you're going to really struggle to get bit on bait just for, for, for pressure reasons or forage reasons when they're still going to be detonating every single frozen flyer with its wings pinned, pinned out that you put off the side of the boat. And you know, you'll get a bite 15 feet off the corner of your boat when you got the fish under you. I mean, they see it and they attack it and it's just a very... You know, is that one? Are you running? Are you doing one bait? Uh, I mean, one flyer off the kite, or no? We we well, it depends on your boat. So most private boats probably just do one at a time. You know, yeah. and it's a quick bite. You bring your stuff. You put another one out. You hook a double. I mean, you're, you're not you're, you're not stationary when you when you're doing the flying flying fish. Or you, you are sometimes. Like, yeah, oh, I you're got getting you. the drifts on it. So you don't necessarily have to move the bait. It kind of just sits out there, all popsicled out, and yeah, yeah. bites on a dead boat. We fish usually a little bit more actively. Um, and, and it kind of corresponds to the different, you know, visual signal and, 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 and actual fish signal that we're getting. I'll, I'll get into that in a sec, but, um, but it, it just depends on the conditions. Um, and then the last way that they're kind of fishing is, uh, is with the spreader bar, right? And the spreader bar being something that's very commonly utilized in the Northeast and the mid and, and, and you know, the, the Eastern seaboard there, but we started getting quite a bit of of traction here on the West Coast over the last, say, year specifically, but probably a couple of years before that without people talking about it, right? And that's been getting a lot of bites too. But the kite fishing and the flyer fishing is, is the bread and butter, and that's what this fishery is built on right now. And it's, and it's truly spectacular to watch it happen because you will spend an entire afternoon when the conditions are right just watching 100 to 300 pound fish just detonate a frozen flying fish on the surface. And when I say detonate, I'm throwing, you're throwing water at these things, right? They're, they're, they're eating them right off the surface. The thing is basically out of the water. <laughs> but we see the fish, you know, a lot of different ways. You know, you'll see heavy volume, right? So it's not really maybe the small wolf pack style fishing that they're doing in the East Coast, you'll see like tremendously big schools of fish, right? Like numbering into thousands of individuals. And, and you'll see that fish, you know, like on our center console, even on our center console and all the head boats and a lot of the bigger boats have sonars and we, and we use our sonars. So we have like a, a CH500 on our, on our sea owner. We have an Omni on our, on our Freeman. So we utilize the sonar to help find that, that big volume and, and to work on these schools. All the sport boats do. The up and down is effective as always. You can run them over and send a bait out and get bit. But when it's sonar fishing, when it's, when it's on the up and down, yeah, you know, you're basically running fish over or you see them on the sonar and you're, you're kind of attacking it with the kite. So you'll do a quick deployment, shoot the kite out, shoot a bait out and just skitter it right over the top and get a detonation on that. Um, sometimes when it's a little bit more sparse or you're just kind of in a, a generalized area where you're getting swim throughs when there's schools moving through an area, you can just dead boat it, a couple kites off the corner. Sometimes we just use the straight balloon when there's no wind and there's just zero wind and you can't really, because so unlike like maybe some of the conditions when all you got to do is float like a small individual bait fish, you know, you can get away with, with the helium in a, in a light wind, uh, a light wind kite, or even just a light wind kite with no helium if you're just trying to suspend a single bait fish, but we're, we have to suspend a, maybe a two pound, you know, giant flying fish. You know, that's, that's like, you know, well over a foot long. It's a big old bait. So you do need a pretty decent amount of lift. So sometimes when there's no wind, we'll just use a single big helium balloon and just rubber band that to the line about say 75 or hundred feet above it. And that'll just, that'll hold a bait out and you can wrap schools doing that. Um, and then a lot of times we get, even on the foam or fishing where, where it's big fish and you're just making a conscientious decision to try to hook this fish on the heavy tackle that you can get away with at the kite. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll do deployments on foamers that are fast moving fish or big active surface feeding schools. And then we have shiners and then we have breezers, shiners being fish that are moving, you know, fast, but they're slightly subsurface, but you can see them glinting in the sunlight, right? So you'll sometimes see it just marking with a single turn bird, sometimes not marking at all. Sometimes you just see a very subtle change in the texture of the water above it. Uh, and that fish responds really well to the kite, you know, as well uh, in, in the dead flyer or the California flyer or the yummy flyer. Uh, and then uh, you see breezers, which is kind of that, uh, that same style of fish that maybe they're doing in the Northeast where they're harpooning it, right? So their sickle fins are out of the water. It's just schools of fish that are just breaking the surface with their, with their fins. Um, and you'll see those breezers and those respond really, really well to the kite too. The thing with the kite is you get bites across the full spectrum of that experience, right? Whereas if we're trying to catch fish on the lures, 
when these fish are solely keyed on, say, anchovy, you know, the, the opportunity is pretty much dictated by how they're foraging to get consistent good bites relative to what you can do with the kite. I'm not saying you can't catch a fish on a lure when they're being very fickle and inactive or if they're not up feeding, but when they're not up feeding on those, on those defined forage bases, you can still get bit pretty much very, very, very well on the kite. Uh, whereas you're not going to get a lot of bites on the stick bait unless you're basically inserting it into the foam or inserting it into a very active feeding scenario. Um, so the kite's kind of the end all be all right, where we also use the, the live flying fish a little bit. So you'll net them at night, you know, and, and you can, you can, you can fish the live flyers, but, but that's kind of labor intensive and there's not really a big, uh, way for, for, for most operations to, to, to acquire the live flying fish. So the kite is the, the, the beta choice and they sell frozen flyers. Like you guys can buy Ballyhoo, you <laughs> know? So it's very interesting, super unique, uh, super unique bluefin fishery, but man, the volume's incredible. I mean, the, the, let me the, ask the, the, you, let me ask you about, you know, you, you, you talked about it being a fishery that like it kind of came back in 2015 or sometime around then is yeah. what I've gathered from, from watching, watching things. And you saying that what, why, why did it come back? Was there like some sort of crazy regulation that, that brought the fish back or was it changing current or something like that? You know, I think that's like a, a big fundamental question. That's that yeah. a lot of people ask a lot. Right. And, 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 and as much as the question is, why did it come back? There's also this other question of when will it go away? Right. Because yeah. Everybody in California basically grew up and lived through a time when this fishery did not exist. And in and, and, and the birth of sport fishing, theoretically or, or historically, as it's understood, it, it happened in, in Southern California in a lot, a lot of ways through the Southern California Tuna Club, through the Avalon Tuna Club, which is a th- Southern California uh, fishing club based on Catalina Island. And kite fishing was developed, you know, in, in, in as lore says it. You know, it was developed to catch these bluefin tuna at the at the beginning of last century. Uh, you know, with flying fish on the kite developed here in Southern California, and that's that's what Laura will say. And I'm sure you know everybody has different stories on the origin. Uh, but this fish was not here, and it wasn't around through through most of my child through all of my childhood through through even the old time captains. None none of them had seen it. There was no precedent for it for 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 decades upon decades, right? Um, or at least not as it's understood today. Uh, but yeah, it could have been a regulation-based thing. Some people say that after the 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 her, the, the big uh, the tsunami in Japan, that it that it did such a, a number on the on the on the bluefin uh, commercial operations there in Japan, and in in the general ideas that a lot of this fish actually comes from Japan, and we've caught tagged fish in California that were that were tagged as five-pound fish off the coast of Japan that we recaught in California at say 60 pounds. So some people say that the reprieve that the population got out there might've contributed, but I think a lot of it can also be attributed to, uh, you know, maybe a little tightening of, of the Mexican uh, f- uh, commercial fishing, you know, regulations instead of just a free for all with the Saners, they've really in, in, enacted pretty strict quotas you know, for the Persane operations that happened both above and below the border. A lot of the fishing has gone from just wrapping fish and selling them for cat food, you know, to actually wrapping maybe per, perhaps smaller volume and then moving those fish into tuna pens where they're raised and harvested, you know, as a, as a more premium product. And then obviously there's the cyclical nature of fishing, right? When we saw this fish come back, it corresponded with, uh, with, with the, the best El Nino year that California... California's ever seen and California doesn't traditionally see fish like blue marlin and wahoo and some of these hyper exotic species. But in, in 2014 and 2015, uh, we had like a really, really crazy El Nino event and the water got really warm and we, we had wahoo and we had blue marlin, you know, in Southern California, which had really never been seen before then and, and, and hasn't really been seen since. Uh, and that just happened to correspond, you know, with this, with this, great revival in the bluefin fishery. So you'll ask people and they, they have different answers. I'm not, I'm not a scientist in that, in that, in that regard, you know, to fully be able to answer it from a, from a scientific standpoint, but I think maybe perhaps there's a little bit of contributing factors from each of those, but largely cyclical, right? I think that's the general consensus that people say is that, you know, it's cyclical, but the question is with cycles is how long do cycles last, right? Just because we only have soon, a moment. As soon as I go out there, it will end. <laughs> well, we can only look at a cycle through 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 like a, a human perspective. We live short lives, right? Yeah, yeah. A cycle could be a thousand year cycle. It could be much longer than 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 cycles as we understand it. It could easily be a hundred year cycle. You don't really know, you know. And and I think that people are are, 
often look at things only in the framework of their own existence, right? So we say, oh my God, what it's been so long since we've seen this, but it's really just a drop in the barrel of the of the overall ocean ecosystem. So maybe it'll be here for one more season. Maybe it'll be gone next year and we'll just say, wow, we really had a good, you know, here in here in the 20 teens. Or or, or maybe uh Maybe we'll, we'll get to enjoy it for decades to come. You, you, you like to hope that, that, that good management is, is something that, that, that we can look to and say, hey, this is maybe an example of, of, of responsible science and, and good fisheries management protecting a fishery you know, and allowing it to be revitalized. And, and, and that would be great because that would be something consequential that we could look to as a win. But it could be something so simple as, as changing oceanic currents that just pulled a different block of fish from a different part of the Pacific and, and dropped it here. But the forge is a huge basis point, right? So I kind of said like, yeah, we had this incredible, you know, volume of, of, of forge fish. And, and I think you could ask yourself, like, why is there not maybe the same fishery off the coast of Florida? Or why don't you see as much yellowfin tuna, right? Tucking close to the beach in Florida. Well, is there a forge base to, to, to sustain large volumes of tuna, as in thousands of tons of tuna, right? Yeah. Does it exist? We have, we have anchovy volume that, that, that is absolutely incredible. You know, you have like this humongous, you know, volume of anchovies and squid and, 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 and just different, different forge bases that sustain these thousands upon thousands upon thousands of tons of tuna, plus all the other fish and life that lives here. You, know, like you wouldn't so say that, that maybe technology or just the amount of fish fishermen out there now has maybe just, you know, that's what's helped create this fishery or it just this fishery literally appeared in the last five years or so just out of nowhere. And to go along with that, like, were the anchovies and stuff always there and the tuna's not? Or? Well, yeah, I mean, the anchovy base has always been like the, the forage base, right? It's, it's as endemic to our waters as, 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 as any of your bait fishes to, to Florida's waters, right? You know, as, as a pilchard is or something, right? Or a mullet. Uh, it's the base, right? And squid is too. And a lot of years, the fish are actually eating more squid than they are anchovies. And they transition between the two, right? If you're seeing foam, they're anchovy. But I'll tell you this as, as a reference point. When I was growing up, I, I grew up. Uh, in a, in a pre tuna era, you know, where we were actually probably going through some La Nina years, which is the opposite end of, of, of the, of the oceanic kind of conditional cycle. Right. So when you're in these La Nina years, it's, it's dominated by colder currents and colder water. So back then when I was growing up, I primarily fished inshore species like bass, right? Calico bass, which is like the large mouth bass of saltwater. And I used to take a 17 foot Boston whaler, which is the first boat I ever owned. And we'd run from, from, from San Pedro, which is in coastal Los Angeles. And we'd leave some from San Pedro and we'd drive to, to Catalina Island or, or San Clemente Island, which was, is, which is like 60 miles off the coast. Uh, in that time frame, we, 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 we made these, these massive, you know, pelagic runs, these open water runs, to, you know, sometimes 200 miles a day, the same runs that we make now to fish tuna, uh, but just to fish for, for inshore species at these islands instead of tuna that are living outside of them. In that time frame, we just didn't see the fish. It wasn't really there. Right. It would be impossible to do a dozen of those runs nowadays, the same waypoints that we were taking at the peak of the season uh, and not see tuna. It just wouldn't be possible. You would see the precursor sign. You would physically see this fish. Now, I also do have memories uh, from, from the summer months when I was young and I was working on sport fishing boats, you know, and not fishing bass. We were fishing marlin, fishing striped marlin, fishing striped marlin tournaments. And I have very vivid memories of us driving through acres and acres and acres of foaming bluefin tuna right? And this would be in probably 2007, 2008, maybe 2009. Uh, but seeing very heavy volume of this fish, uh, but not big fish, right? There's always been 30 pound fish. There's always been 20 pound fish. That fish was always there and we always fished it. The exceptional thing isn't the presence of bluefin tuna, it's the presence of 200 pound tuna. That's the fish that didn't exist. Yeah. We've yeah. always had bluefin. It's just, we haven't seen them in this size. To see triple digit fish, that's the, that's the, that's the, the unfathomable thing, if you were to talk to somebody, if you were to go back in time seven or eight years and, and go to an average guy and be like, hey, get ready. In a few years, you guys are going to be catching 300 pound tuna, you know, all year round. People would have laughed in your face and called you crazy. So, and there's no such thing. There's, there's no thing that uh, there's no like long line or fishery that got shut down or anything. I mean, I, it, most of the, the concerted fishing pressure is from purse sainers. Uh, and like I kind of said, uh, there has been a transition away from just like wrapping stuff for cat food from a bluefin perspective to more mm -hmm. low yield, but, but, but high premium bluefin yield. Uh, and, and the quotas are, are relatively small and they usually hit their quotas really quickly when the season starts. Like they hit their quotas in like January, you know what I mean? Because the cyclical nature the, or the migratory cycle of this fish 
it's up here right now. It's going to pull back down, you know, into Mexican waters. And it usually seems to winter, you know, about 100 or 200, you know, miles down the line, uh, down the coast below the border, you know, and, and when it's down there, it's still being fished and, and, and they'll usually quote out pretty early, you know, in the calendar year. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's just, I think it's, it's, it's a great thing, you know, and, 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 and it's been awesome and it seems, seems super healthy. There's also, you know, there's always going to be a conversation about it. And I think there's probably been more of a conversation about preservation now than there might've been in the past where people are kind of like, okay, like how do we make sure this lasts? And it's something that we think about, but at the same time, there's, there's a really vibrant, you know, commercial rod and reel fishery that supports a lot of my friends and, and a lot of captains and a lot of people out here. And that seems pretty healthy and sustainable and guys are getting after it there. Um, I think if, if, if it continues to feel stable and healthy over the next few years, you know, with, with the increase in fishing pressure and also an increase in fishing effectiveness, that's come from, like I kind of mentioned, fully maturing sport fishing programs that are really embracing the full spectrum of, 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 of how to catch them. If it continues to be stable, that would be great, right? It would be fantastic because that would show that, that the sport fishery isn't really impacting it too much. Um, but there's definitely still some asterisks and some, some question marks about, about kind of the long-term prospects for the fishery, you know? But we're enjoying it while we can. Like yeah. I said, it's world-class. It's absolutely world class, and if you want to go out and, and, and try and really see what's probably some of the sickest tuna fishing that's available in the world, I mean, you got to get out to California and do it. There's some really great charter operations, uh, and there's some just some really good people who can put you guys on like literally all day long catching two hundred pound fish. It's incredible. Yeah. Do you uh, do you still see or catch small small bluefins too? Yeah, yeah, like there's thirty forty small pounders. Fish yeah, right, gotcha. and, right, cool. and I think that's that's actually a good thing that you mentioned because it would be unhealthy if we didn't, right? Yeah. And I think you can often look at the the the, the year class of fish, and it'll be a little predictive of of what's coming in the next couple of years. So we'd like to see that really healthy volume of thirty pounders and fifty pounders and sixty pounders and ninety pounders, you know, as as a basis point for your future hundred pounders. We we see several different classes. You know, we see that this very small fish uh, being like a ten pound fish but it's not really the most common fish we see because I don't think there's really that much of that base fish around because I think part of the, 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 the big scientific question right now is do the fish spawn in California or when they reach a certain maturity, are they going elsewhere to spawn and reproduce? And that's why we're not seeing maybe 800 pounders here, like, like it's genetically in, in, in species possible. Well, they don't, they don't get typically the bluefins in the Pacific don't typically get that big. As the, the as Southern, yeah, they do actually. Okay, yeah. Right. Yeah, they are very okay. capable it's the same fish. It's a southern bluefin. I mean, they can get to be seven, eight hundred pounds. No problem. I gotcha. right. But we don't traditionally see them in the eastern Pacific. The, the the general notion is that they go elsewhere to spawn and reproduce. Maybe Japan. Maybe you know the the, the western Pacific, right? Gotcha. Um, so the, I think one of the big scientific questions right now is, is is whether or not the fish are reproducing here, and whether or not at some point we're going to start to consistently see, say, a five or six hundred pound fish. Right? That would be really cool and crazy. Right yeah. now, we're not. They tend to cap out at about four hundred pounds. That's about the biggest fish we're catching right now, which is a great fish. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. the ceiling, right? Uh, but we see fish, you know, a lot of fish in the in the 20 to 30 pound range, very, very large volume of that fish. And we see a lot of fish in that 60 to 80 pound range. And we see see a fish usually in, in another grade of fish in like that 90 to 120 pound range. Uh, and then we see the big hundred pounders, which are like 180s to say 220s. And then we see like the big 200 pounders, which are like the, 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 the 250 pluses, right? The, the 250 to 300 pounders. And then we see these really big three to 400 pound fish, you know, uh, with, with, with less of that big three, 400 pound fish, but a lot of that 100 to 200 pound fish. That's like the, the bread and butter. It's like this, this really nice 120 to 200 pound fish. So, yeah. It's, well, it's, I don't know. Uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about that, uh, that sight fishing you were telling me about? Cabo. All right. Yeah, we should talk about Cabo. Uh, Cabo's great, man. Um, you know, I, I, it's funny because, because, you know, there's so much, there's so many people who are coming to Cabo right now to fish. And, and obviously that's a, that's a mag thing. Um, but there's this really cool kind of locals fishery down here, which is, which is what the charter operations do really well. A lot of West coast teams build their whole programs around the idea of finding fish in the gyros and, 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 and casting out them on the bow. Uh, and that fishery is viable year round, but it's really good in, in, in the late fall, in the winter, in the spring, you know, as the water uh, cools off a little bit, you know. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's a really unique, special way to catch billfish. Uh, basically, we, we sit in the gyros all day and we find sickle fins, you know, and we. So we, these are, these are like 
these are like you say the ones that are they're not like cutting on bait i mean you you would find that but you're kind of looking for like an individual fish yeah i mean the feeder fishing that, that happens in mag well so a few things about 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 mag uh you know mag is 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 obviously like a, a centerpiece right um mm-hmm. But the same style of fishing that happens in Mag happens on all, really all the way down to Cabo, different mm-hmm. times of year, different seasons. A lot of times that volume that's at Mag doesn't even hit Mag. It hits, it hits on the local banks, right? And there's been plenty of years where it's way better within day trip range of Cabo than it is in Mag. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's just a question of forage as well, just like with the tuna. Uh, when the fish is, is doing that, obviously that's how people fish them. Just, well, how we would fish them? All right, we see those feeders. You see the cutters. You guys call them the cutters. We call them feeders, whatever. Uh, some people drive circles around them and try to pull them off the bait balls and we just bow into them and cast a mackerel and catch the same fish. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's just a difference in philosophy, right? It's a more di- di- direct manner of fishing. Um, but if you're a West Coast bill fisherman, you, 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 are, you are raised and you are trained and you are taught how to cast a mackerel and conventional tackle. You're taught how to cast conventional tackle uh, and, and, and you're taught how to cast at, at fish, whether that's feeders or tailors. Um, you're totally expected to be able to make a, a hundred foot cast with a talc of 16. Uh, and, and, and that's just how it is. Yeah. And that, and that's the standard and, and, and that's how we fish. Um, my favorite fishing probably at this point in my life is, is tailor fishing. I love it. So like when the wind starts blowing and, and it's, and it's a little green and the water's a little green or you're on a nice break point and, and the fish are eating squid, they're going to eat squid all morning and then they're going to float in the wind and the wind starts blowing in the afternoon and that fish floats and it just tails down swell. It was down swell. And there's some spots that, you know, I'd really like to fish it right out of Cabo, certain shear lines, certain wind lines, certain areas where you can kind of like set up and, and do cross tacks in the wind and just see just endless streams of striped marlin tailing out of the wind. And, and as opposed to trying to get in front of them and drag a dredge bass and we try to raise these fish on the chains, you know, we got guys who can make these really nice technical casts and they go to the bow and they catch this fish. And, and uh, it's super unique. It's super cool. But that is Cabo striped marlin fishing. This dredge fishing and, and a lot of what's happening right now is, is cool and it's fun. But culturally, Cabo is, Cabo is, a, is a casting fishery. Culturally, you know, the boats yeah. that the guys who've been fishing here a lot longer than I have uh, are, are guys who, who predominantly, if the options present themselves, if they're seeing fish on the surface, they're, they're catching fish on the surface and they're catching them on the bow. And we build our boats around this philosophy. You have bow bait tanks and bow rails and West Coast bow rails. You can, always, you can always tell which, like, I live in a, like the first stop from, from Viking yeah. in, in New Jersey where they, where they take the boats down on the, like, you can always tell the, the boats that are, that are going to get on a uh, sure. get on a ship, get tar- taken over. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty cool. But what do you? I find that so interesting. So because we're, I guess we we want to be the. Uh, I I find it interesting. I want to go back to how you say that the spreader bars are catching on and in in Southern California and the dredges and then the dredges and stuff in in Mag Bay. How was that like? Because we like up here in on the east in in the Mid Atlantic like the idea of live baiting for a white marlin and it's not like you guys live bait it's like hanging them in the riggers like like they do in the keys nick yeah. like we like that makes us sick like how is that for the purest of of people in the fishery seeing you know maybe some different tactics to or to some people like if you catch a uh, tuna on a spreader bar are, are you just fucking ruining tuna fishing in southern oh, california 100 percent. we hate spreader bar fishing. <laughs> you guys are ridiculous they put their spreader bars like a mile behind the boat and just cut you off all day and then you can't go attack your schools because some guys got like a spreader bar a mile back it's it's absolutely ridiculous but here let, let me say this Spread, dredge fishing is a new in Cabo. People have been dredge fishing in Cabo for as long as dredge fishing has existed. And yeah. there's plenty of really good, effective local teams that predominantly dredge fish. And it's an ownership question. How does the owner want to fish? Mm-hmm. How does the people want to fish? If you're a charter boat, it's a lot easier to take clients who are inexperienced and, 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 and have them feed value to fish than it is to expect them to be able to cast a conventional setup on the bow, right? Yeah. So dredge fishing in Cabo is as endemic in common as it is anywhere else in the world, right? Chain fishing as well. It's all, it's all the same stuff. Every team worth its salt knows how to do both, right? Gotcha. Yeah. It comes down to a, a question of, of personal enjoyment and choice. Mm-hmm. If you have a choice between doing carousels around these spots of fish and just trying to like pull them off an existing food source and then just kind of do this like very repetitive, you know, slide, you know sliding value into their mouth dealio, 
or you can, or you can like. You talk like, about it with such disdain, though. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I mean, culturally, there's a cultural separation. I think it's. I think that it's. 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 A, I think it's a lesser form of sport fishing. Yeah. I mean, I'm not. I'm, I'm not gonna lie. I, I think that there's like a way more. I think that casting a fish on the bow is more challenging and more enjoyable. I think you're more in touch with the fish. I think it's a totally different experience to hook fish in clean water than it is in dirty water. And I think it takes a higher degree of skill for, from an angling perspective. It's rod and hand technical, rod and hand fishing. You know, the expectations are higher on the angler. And I understand that dredge fishing is like the way that people do it. And we dredge fish and everybody dredge fishes in plenty of tournaments are one dredge fishing and plenty of people dead bait fish. And there's nothing wrong with it inherently. It's a style of fishing and it's a question of ownership and how owners choose to fish and how crews feel comfortable fishing. Yeah. But once you start fishing a different way, if you enjoy it, I mean, you stick to it. And I grew up fishing a, a different way and we enjoy it and we stick to it. I enjoy the reward that you get from maybe finding a fish in the gyros and then casting at it. I enjoy the spectacle of watching a marlin eat a bait in clean water, you know, on the bow. And I mean, I'm somebody who grew up rod and hand fishing. I do a lot of small boat fishing. I skiff fish by myself or with a small crew all the time. I'm somebody who as a captain really enjoys rod and reel fishing. So the older I've gotten, I've become way less consumed with volume and numbers and way more consumed with, with the experiential aspect of fishing. Stripe marlin are a very dumb fish. These are not a very smart fish, right? Like, what's I, just think, like I just think y'all have a fuck ton of them there. <laughs> and no, you no, can no, the barn, have... <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, a, it ex, it's an extremely healthy striped marlin fishing. Yeah. And, and, and it's a, a striped marlin fishing that, that, that you can engage with in so many different ways, right? Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, I, I do think it's a little crazy that people drive all the way across the world and spend like months and months and months fishing in Cabo and just do the same fucking thing every single day. Yeah. I mean... I find that... I find that... And where I, I'm sure we're talking about the same boats, but I find that... <laughs> I find that really like I'm like I'm like because I've I, I, this will be my third trip to to the Cabo area to to go straight marlin fishing and like it's a cool thing for me to go yeah or me and my crew to go because we, we don't have our boats it's fucking forty degrees here our boats about to go south to North Carolina we don't have like a, fish, a bill fishery here we're just gonna go there but I I would find it very difficult and I think my the the guys I work for would would find it very difficult to just go out for and like season after season and and whack them and catch even even straight marlin no matter how you do it just that many you know i just think I mean, are they, but here's the thing are they really even catching them i mean def, define like i mean, I mean getting is it i guess even the, real, i mean like I, at what point is it is is a lot of this fishing just to 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 is just for the insatiable egos of the owners I mean, I, I feel like a lot of the, uh, at this point, a lot of the fishing that's happening in Cabo isn't really that experience to begin with. You're not focused on the spectacle. There's this, there's a, you go to Mag and there's this like incredible natural spectacle that's happening all around you. And mm -hmm. people are so consumed with, 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 with social media gratification and in meaningless volume, meaningless number metrics. And, and I think they're totally out of touch with what's actually happening in the uniqueness of the fishery. And, and that's part of the choices that I've made and a lot of other people make to kind of like say, like, are we really counting at this point? Yeah, yeah. I, will, I would. That's, down. that's, what, like, that's kind of what I was getting at. Like people like to, to do it, to do it to the level that some of these boats are doing it, making it seems like some of these boats are going making wherever the wherever the biggest biggest pile may be with uh a fish like whether it be the potato bank or the finger yeah. bank or all the way at the bag like yeah. they just go and they just do it and are they like to me it would get i love going there but after like the third after the second day in mag bay i'm just like man i'm just gonna sit back and fucking take this all in you know because you just <laughs> like you get you do get lost on you're like holy shit there's like a giant you know i don't know what kind of whale it is but a giant fucking whale and it's just yeah. eating the same Jump thing in as the, the water and see what's happening under the yeah, yeah i think that you have the right perspective on it too which is like again is you're you're somebody who's, who spent some time you're not a ton of time but you come out here it's like wow it's amazing look at the whales look at the life look at what's happening yeah. around you and i mean i think that at this point like a lot of what's happening at mag you know you have people who are chasing these accolades you know whether it's you know it, it's 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 doing better than than your buddy on, on the other boat or, or you're looking for some billfish foundation award or or you're mm -hmm. doing something and it's like again it's it's the focus is is on this 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 raw volume efficiency right uh and very little on the actual fish itself and, and i think it's borderline disrespectful at times you know yeah. 
Now, what do you think? Like, I mean, I, I, I like, I guess it to me, it seems like there's endless fucking straight Marlins. But so, at, so, at some point between Cabo and Mag Bay or wherever the water turns really cold, there's just an <laughs> endless supply of striped Marlins. Yeah, and, you're do, catching the same fish. Yeah, over but my, and over my, and over again. <laughs> my question is, my question is, like, do you think, like, I mean, we a lot of times in America, in, in, in our history and fishing and just just fisheries around the world we don't really realize that a, a certain fishery is in trouble or is getting impacted until till till you really start noticing some some shit so my thing is like i mean it doesn't seem so fragile but it, is it maybe do you think that it may be more fragile and are we are, are people catching and releasing I mean, even though the vast majority of fish caught and released, so however method you want to use, you're typically yeah. using a, a circle hook and, you know, they're, they're getting released healthily, but there are some that just don't survive and it's just the way it is. Or say you, you break, like we got, we had like six on one day, we were fishing on this massive boot and we just, like, we, we got the leader on one and then it just smoked us all the way to the point that it oh. spooled us completely. And yeah, it's there's, like, there's, there's plenty of fish that are running around with line. Yeah. So, so so that's how do you kind of think the, that the illusion of plenty concept that, yeah. that I think that, 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 that you bring up is something that I also, we talk a lot about in California where we see these huge volumes of tuna in very small areas. And you ask yourself, are you fishing for the entire biomass of fish at a time? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So here's the thing. This is kind of how I view the Cabo, the, the, the stripe model and deal in that. And I'll just be honest about it. Right. First of all, it's been happening for decades. Mm -hmm. Thousands of boats, hundreds of programs have been fishing this for decades. It's nothing new. It's been there for the entirety of fishing has happened, uh, you know, in the Baja region. So, so just because it's showing up on their, everybody's radar right now doesn't mean that it's a new fishery. There's nothing new about it. This has been going on forever. Okay. So that's, that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, uh, yeah, I do think that the pressure is, is going to have an impact at some point, the same way the pressure had an impact in Costa Rica and basically every other fishery that became super popular and had a lot of people show up to fish it, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I do think teams that come out here, especially teams that haven't spent a lot of time out here, have to be conscientious of the impacts that they're having with anything they're doing, right? And that's not yeah. me just being hyper-localized. It's me being mm -hmm. rational and reasonable, right? You don't really have any ownership per se over this fishery. Nobody does, but you do have ownership of responsibility. And the impetus is on the captains, the crews, and the owners, and actually more so on the owners because the owners dictate what the captains and crews do. And I think there's a lot of times that the captains are kind of like, eh, I don't know if this is necessarily ethical, but they might get overruled by owners that are chasing these, these accolades and metrics and things, right? So I think that the ownership goes all the way up and down the chain, and there has to be a, a conversation about it, right? But I think a lot of that conversation comes down to what quantifies a release, all right? Yes. We all operate under these like tournament you know, specs where it's, oh my God, 30 foot leader, call to release, pop it off. There you go. And you're chasing numbers and you want those triple digit numbers and you want all of these things. But let's be real about it. You're just breaking off fish. All right. Yeah. Marlon are dumb. They're going to jump behind the boat. They'll give you a shot at 30 feet almost all the time. Usually right after you hook them. And if you're really aggressive, you'll get that shot right away. But are you defeating this fish? Yeah. No, of course yeah. not. You're just grabbing the leader and breaking them off. Like, like, and it's like this, this, this delusion of numbers that's getting pushed around on social media and it's getting pushed around by people who do fish tournaments where this is an acceptable thing and, and you're fishing on, uh, uh, with these tournament rules and there's nothing wrong with that because that is what tournaments are and you work within the framework of tournaments and you're competing and you're trying to make money, but you're not competing for money in Mag Bay. The only competition is is for social media accolades, uh, yeah. ownership accolades, crew accolades amongst each other. And I think for the programs that spend a lot of time up there that have done it all at this point, you guys have all caught hundreds of fish. You guys have caught thousands of fish. You're hooking hundreds of fish a day. Like at some point, like you guys, like maybe it's time to start talking about like having like maybe uh, – a higher standard for what a release actually is, you know? And if, if I was, if I was to be real, or just, I mean, it's kind of, I, I, I did, I, another fishery that's kind of like this is, or not like this, but you could draw a parallel is the, the guys that fish up uh, the Canadians that fish up in Nova Scotia's for the giant oh, bluefins. They have a certain rules and I don't know if that was fishery uh, like uh organically came about or if it was imposed by the government that they can only fight fish for so long and other yeah. things like like this so I, I i mean i just find it interesting i mean nobody wants to see it go away and oh, you don't want to see it get any 
you know, you, you just have such an abundant resource now. You don't want to see it getting any worse either. Well, a lot of these guys, like a lot of these programs are just going to come up here, bang the fishery up for a couple of years and never come back. Mm-hmm. It's just yeah, part of their overall life programs. And so they don't have really any incentive to, to, to show responsibility. Um, the thing is, listen, I'm not somebody who's going to say that we want to regulate it, that it should be legally regulated because that's a slippery slope, right? Yeah, because I agree. You no, know, they're just not going to let you catch them at all. So you have to be kind of like cautious with that. Like I said, I think it kind of comes down to a question of ownership and professionalism on behalf of the crews to, you know, if you're, if you're coming into a fishery that, that you've never been in before, I think that you have to be responsible at how you portray it on social media. I think that, you know, when I was growing up, you know, in California, you know, when I was young and, and a lot of people when they're young make the mistake of sometimes being a little too brash and, and, and maybe, maybe sharing a little bit too much on social media at times and not really respecting the sanctity of information within the sport. I think that a lot of people came to Mag Bay over the last several years and, and really blew it up and, and hyped it up and, and posted a, a little bit too much and a little bit too freely and didn't really do a good job protecting the sanctity of that fishery. Uh, and I think that it did rub some of the local people and some of the people have been fishing. Oh, it has to. Yeah. Yeah. No. And who's to blame them, you know? And, and who's to blame them? And, and the thing is, I don't necessarily, but you know, blame all these programs because I, you know, maybe they, did, they didn't know any better and who would have thought that the volume of people would have come from all over the world to come fish this place. But at the same time, who wouldn't have when you guys are saying you're catching 250 fish a day? Like I said, yeah. the volume's always been there. But what Mag Bay has always been is like, hey, all the teams coming down to Cabo to fish tournaments, hey, stop in Mag for a week on the way down, have a ton of fun, engage with the fisher. You're not necessarily counting, but you're just catching fish all day. And then you continue down to Cabo to kind of complete your program and fish down there and do the Bisbees and do all that. Um, I think that, you know, there, there should be a conversation professionally amongst crews and owners about, about how to be perhaps a little more responsible, you know, maybe not fishing long leaders, you know, maybe, maybe making a slight effort to cut them close, you know, or actually, you know, slow down a little bit and take care of these fish, you know? Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, I mean, like, like when you have endless opportunity, you can really structure it in a responsible way. It's not like you're fishing for money. Again, you're not fishing for meat. You're not fishing for money. You're fishing strictly for the spectacle. So I do challenge the, the, the owners in these operations. If you remove your egos from the situation and you remove this, this competitiveness among something that is really just one of the most amazing natural spectacles on earth and start really trying to engage with the, with the fishery, perhaps more empathetically and showing a little bit more respect to the fish itself, uh, maybe you'll come to a different conclusion. Now, at the same time, if you have a group of killers that come on your boat, a bunch of really good fishermen, and you guys want to go unload on these things for a day and really challenge yourself for numbers, go do it. It's fishing, man. You want to challenge yourself and, and really go after that record because, the, hey, right now the conditions are super conducive and we want to go like, we actually want to attack that record. By all means, do it. I would love to do it. I'll bring my boat up there and attack that record every day. You know, with a, with a live bait program, I'm sure we'll do it at some point. Bro, I'll stay about, another couple of days just to yeah. go up there with you and tech. Yeah. <laughs> no, I expect when you're out here, I, I expect you to come fishing when you're here 100%. That's yeah. there's an open invitation. Anybody, any of these programs that want to go experience some of the West Coast style fishing, there is an open invitation to, to, to come fishing. I have my, my, my 30 foot conch sits in, in San Jose and I, we, I'm fishing almost every day. But um, so, so again, I'm, I'm, let me preview. I'm not saying I think that's that, too that, small that, for Anthony. I'm not going to lie. Oh, God. God. <laughs> for, for what they do, dude, as long as it's not rough, I don't really care. Yeah, well, we're going to pound straight up so 150 miles, and you're going to enjoy every second of it, all right? Every <laughs> moment. So it's just to, to, to again, it's a matter of personal choice, guys, all right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not going to say that these guys are villains. Um, I think that there should be a conversation around responsibility that happens in every fishing program anywhere on the planet. People should do the right thing. When, when presented with the option to do the right thing. And I think that people should stop posting so much on social media. Uh, when you find something really cool, sometimes it's cool to just keep it to yourself and protect it because in an era where information is so cheap and everything is so easy and people are more than willing to spend millions and millions of dollars to get after these things, you do have to kind of protect the sanctity of information and you have to protect these fisheries or else it's going to happen. People are going to show up, all right? Uh, it is, it's an inevitability. And another note, for some of these local operations, all right? A lot of times with this money being spent there or down in Cabo, there's not really a tremendous trickle down. I fully encourage these operations, try to hire local guys. There's plenty of people who would love to work in Cabo, right? When you guys come to a foreign fishery, you should make an effort 
to return some money to the community that you're interacting with. And that goes to, to, to a question of personnel, right? If you guys are going to come down here with your big heavy hitting operations and take up a bunch of doc space, then you should be hiring as many local people as you can and supporting the local community. It comes down to a question of bait. Are you guys aware? And I'm not saying you guys, but I'm just saying people in general are, should be fully aware that you can buy your ballyhoo from the local bait pongas at the mouth of the harbor every morning in as much volume as you need. If you say, hey, I need a thousand ballyhoo, you don't need to be unzipping or cutting open vacuum packed bait masters from Florida. You guys have freezers lining the dock and you guys spend so much time rigging baits. You should be reinvesting your, your money and your wealth into some of the local bait operations and supporting these guys. If, if you say, I need 2000 value, they will bring you the most beautiful locally caught blue back value I did, you've ever seen. I didn't yeah, fucking that's, know that's that. a great point. You know? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that they'd, yeah, I didn't. And it, it just comes they're... down to respecting the community, right? So like, so, so you're down here and you're taking a lot. So give back a lot too. And, and like every day when I leave the harbor, like we, 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 we I'm never, we buy our ballyhoo from our local guy. We get our cab we catch our own mackerel, you know? And there's a lot of guys down here that would be happy if you just asked them, you know? Yeah. If you're in San Jose, find Cuate, go on channel 14 and say, Cuate, what's up? Cuate's the guy. He's going to come by. Hey, Cuate, I'm going fishing a week. I need a thousand value. Maybe he can, maybe he can't, but maybe he can. Give your money yeah. to a local guy and he'll appreciate you. And they'll take care of you all the time. They'll take care of you all year round. They'll get you your sardinas when you need to fish the bisbees. They're going to get you everything you need. So I would say definitely uh, try to integrate yourself into the local community as much as you can. Even if you're a traveling program that's only there for a year, you'll never know what you'll find, right? It's good yeah. for respect too. It, it gets you to respect the local community. That's a big thing. Like I, I'm, I'm a gringo. I'm a Californian, right? I've been coming to Cabo my whole life. I've been fishing down here professionally as a captain for the last, I think, five, six years, running a boat, fishing down here a lot longer as a mate. Um, I fish mostly with local guys. They're my friends. You know, I'm down here a lot. I interact with them. I fish with them. I build my crews with local guys as a, as a, as a, as a, as a respect thing because I enjoy fishing with locals. I think they're hardworking guys who are extremely knowledgeable. But it, it, as, as a respect thing, you know, just because it's nice to know that you're supporting local families and that when we're down here with our millions and millions of dollars in machines and gear, that there is a, a trickle down impact on these communities that are built around fishing. You know, there's a lot of boats that come down here seasonally that 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 have crews lined up and have connections to this community that have not been able to come down this year because there's no room for them in the marinas because of all the traveling programs there's a lot of guys from california who've been coming down here for decades and this is the first year that they can't get down here because all the slips are taken in all these marinas right and there's a lot of guys you know maybe local guys who fished on these same boats and kind of rely on those you know three four month contracts and in, in, in weekly pay to get by that might not have their operation down here this year you know, something to think about. Oh, it's yeah. just stuff to think about. It's just about connectivity to the community, guys. I know you guys know that because like, Nick, you, you, you fish all over the Caribbean, right? Like you guys know, and I know that you connect yeah. really well with, with these communities when you go there, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, just yeah. a general thing. No, for sure. Yeah, Dominican Republic's a great place for that. I mean, typically, like you said, every boat there typically always has at least it's, one, you know, Dominican mate on their boat, you know? Yeah. It's almost like an unwritten rule when we used to take our boat to, to East of Harris on the Caribbean side and you just hire somebody. Maybe, I mean, depends on what you, you know, some boats take somebody to fish with them. Some boats, you know, hire a couple guys to wash the boat or, or, or something like that. But yeah, I mean, it's uh, as far as I've always been aware, it's kind of been an, a rule, maybe like a, like an unwritten rule to, to try and do that, you know? Yeah. And but. it's it's not like in no way you're trying to demonize any of these boats. I and mean, listen, there's some really amazing professional top tier operations that have come out here. And I think there's a lot of operations that have done it really well, right? A lot of guys, mm -hmm. you know, who are satellite tagging fish that 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 seem like they're making more of an effort, right? At this point, some of the more established teams. I'm not gonna name any names or anything, but like it does seem like some of the teams do a really good job with it, you know. Um I just a general note, it's just all these things are just things that everybody can think about. And I think anywhere you go in in, in the the fishing world you always have to think about it it's very easy to come in brash and heavy hitting it's a lot harder to walk with a softer kind of tone nowadays you know everything's very loud and everything's a spectacle and um the the, the price of such spectacles uh, is sometimes respect it's somewhat experiential sometimes the things that you miss are the things that you don't even really know you're missing until mm -hmm. you you separate yourself from 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 all the big names and in 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 the big videos and and in 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 just the, the the marketing element of sport fishing and just the 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 spectacle that is social media and in 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 egos and attention 
and, and just take a little moment. I think every captain and crew should do it for sure. I think that every single person who's a professional in this industry should go dark from time to time and just reconnect with what it means to be a fisherman. What was the uh, phrase you used earlier? The sanctity of information. That should be the name of this podcast, man. <laughs> the like sanctity it. of information. People fucking. I I, I agree with you. I well, mean, like when Nick, when you're getting ready to do yourself, I mean, you're not talking about like what, what you're doing. You know what's <laughs> up. You're, yeah. you're very quiet. Everybody's very quiet. And yeah. obviously, it's not the same stakes, right? You're just everybody's just trying to have fun. Everybody's just trying to have fun. So like, yeah, tell you, it's not like you gotta, you gotta be like, oh my God, I can't tell you where to strike tomorrow. Like, I'm here, not saying that. Here's know? a good, good, uh, good example is we have a, we have, we have really, we can have really good yellowfin tuna fishing and big eye tuna fishing up here, uh, in, in May and June. And I was, we were fortunate enough to be one of the first boats that can't come here earlier in the year to go come home to go earlier in the year to go tuna fishing that had a sonar, uh, an Omni, right? Yeah. So I, so I was like, all right, we're out here and we're having great fishing. And we fished a fair amount that, that spring. And at first I'm looking at these huge red blobs on the sonar. And I just noticed like, as we were fishing a, a, a an area of water that was moving, moving southward, we weren't fishing, you know, we were fishing the same general area. And yeah. I just noticed as the season goes on, like during the week, the first week, the, the the fucking blobs on the machine were like, you know, a th- like an eighth of the, of the size of the uh, of the screen and everything. And it was like really good. I just like, oh, I was like, holy shit, just drive over to that red blob. And then all 12 of my rods go down. You know, it's pretty sick. Yeah. Right. As I go down, as as as, you know, more and more as word got out, more and more boats fished it. And on the weekends here, it's astonishing how many boats can fish on a weekend. And then like, say a week and a half, two weeks later, you're fishing the same area and pretty much the same fish. You just notice that the little, the blobs get smaller, you know? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you some interesting stuff. Uh, we have an Omni on our Freeman, which is one of our boats. We fish, uh, we, we, we fish bluefin with it, obviously. And I, we, we have a, a 500 on our, on our sea on it. So we fish. That's black a- block. The 500's a... The 500's a searchlight sonar, right? Okay. It's more traditional sweeping sonar. Um, so, uh, like, we, we use, you know, both sonars for, 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 for our tournament season. Obviously, like, you know, I actually prefer the 500 for, for, for black marlin fishing. Um, uh, but for tuna fishing, obviously, that Omni is that Omni's great. Uh, and it's very fascinating because if you spend a lot of time looking at sonars uh, and then correlating what you're seeing... To, mm-hmm. to, to, to the visible nature of bluefin fishing. And, and, and a lot of our bluefin fishing is very visual, like I was saying earlier. So you do see the correlation between how it looks on the machine and how it looks on the surface. Some days I go out there and, and I'll just pick up a, a school of fish and, and, and it's maybe it's a day when we're just fishing for the mid-grade stuff and it's foaming. It's, it's finding some anchovy and coming up and crashing and foaming and making a big mess of things, maybe once every 15 minutes. Now, traditionally guys are just gonna sit there and just sit there in their gyros and be looking around or just waiting for something. Or maybe there's a bird mark and it's so they're kind of working on the bird, but they're not maybe sure exactly where the school is after it falls apart. They got to wait for it to start puddling back up somewhere and then they run after it. So some days we said we were out there one day with my boss and, uh, and we were out there and we picked up a school and it was coming up like every 10 minutes. And we just sit back with the Omni, chill back, drink a Red Bull, <laughs> stare at the, uh, stare at the screen. And, every, and, and, and just follow the school around. And we're keeping it at like maybe, I don't know, 400 feet, 500 feet off the down. Every time it would find fish, I'd watch the Omni. Every time it would find some chove, you'd see it on the Omni. Because yeah. the school, which was kind of like spread out, would compact really tight, right? Because this is, the, this is the fish starting to key in on a food source. It would compact tight and it would foam. But you knew it was going to foam like 15 seconds before it broke the surface. Because that was the school starting to cycle up a spot of chovy. And as it started to cycle up the chovy, I'm already moving on it. And a small spot of chovy to stay. So it's only staying up for maybe 15 seconds, 20 seconds. So they devour yeah. the whole, whole thing? No, they just kind of like hit it and move on. It's not enough to keep it. You're working on maybe a thousand individuals and a small spot's just not enough to sustain them. They just keep moving. They're moving. They're just, they're, they're kind of on the move. We chase the school or we follow the school for like 10 miles comes up, you know, I don't know, four or five times in between there, but to see a correlation between that red blob that you're talking about and then a specific behavior set. Mm-hmm. Well, now that's interesting stuff. And now you're using the Omni to its full potential. Now you're oh, actually using it as a machine we're, that can, we're gonna, that can tell you behavior. Yeah. Not we're just a location. I told people and people didn't really believe me when we got it. I was like, I'm more aware of what's going on. So when I see something on the surface now, 
like whatever it may be, a couple birds moving at a certain rate of speed or something like that. I'm more aware of what's going on. E- even if I'm running a boat without a sonar, without an Omni now, like which I probably would never will because I haven't ran a different boat in years. Yeah. But but uh, just like just understanding more of what's going on down there. Me and Nick were talking about this on the was it the last episode or two episodes ago, Nick? Or you we even talked about when you got in the water in Panama and stuff like that. It's just like you understand so much more about what what's going on around you, and yeah. it's it's pretty fucking fascinating, man. Well, it's super fascinating when you can correlate that to your past fishing experience right not having <laughs> right so you know okay like this is how a bird's marking fish this is how it's moving yeah. water and then you start to play and then you just add this additional layer of information into the situation and now you're fishing extremely intelligently i've been super fortunate over the last several years to have a boss my boss ivan uh who who's been really supportive of us being able to experiment with technology and really build out these, these machines the way we wanted to build them out, you know? So, so like when I, I've, I've fished, we've been fishing tournaments down here for five years. I fished on a, on a 40 foot Cabo the first two years, you know, we, we won the Bisbee's in 2018 on a 40 foot Cabo called Chinito. We won, you know, $3 million. And in, in, in right, we got to stop talking about, it. you got to tell us about that. now. Just because <laughs> that, I mean, the, dude, that's a fucking light. All right. For so you wanna, like I'll, us, I'll tell you, I'll well, tell you, so you want to know, I'll tell you some funny, I'll tell you a story. I'll tell well, you for people. No, we don't want to hear that like, story. No, no, I, I'm going to tell you, I'll tell you the, a, a story that's relatively complete that I think you'll like. Right. Okay. So in 2017, I was a charter captain in California. I've been a charter captain for a few years. And I'm talking just like very, like a kind of a salt of the earth deal. Like, listen, I'm, I'm wearing the same hoodie five days in a row, right? We're out there, we're fishing bluefin. Like, it's just like, I'm running a, I think I'm running a, a Parker at the time. I actually had a little crystal liner, a 29 crystal liner, which is a local California little twin diesel sport fisher build. I had center console that I did before that, just running charters in, in, in California, just doing the classic five to five all day dealio. And I had a client, right, who, who fished with me a bunch. Nice guy, one of my regulars. Uh, his, name was, his, uh, his name was Davis. Um, and, you know, after fishing with him, you know, for all 2016 and going into to 2017, I said, hey, Davis, like there's this thing in Cabo called the Bisbees. Um, and, uh, and it's really cool. Uh, it's, it's like this big turn. It's the biggest turn in the world. You know, it's millions of dollars. And, and Davis loved this kind of stuff, right? So, so he said, all right, well, we're going to do it. I said, okay, well, we got to find a boat, right? And this is number we got to find a boat. So, and, I, and this, is, this is very, I, I was still a charter guy and I hadn't really delved too much into the private boat side of the industry. I was just doing charters, just put in time. Uh, so I worked with my buddy, Zach Zorn, who's a, a really good yacht broker uh, with Cussler Yacht in San Diego. And we, when we found Davis, we found him a, a, a 2006 40 foot uh, Cabo Express in San Diego. And uh, I went over at the time I was working with, with Cousins Tackle, which is a n- no longer existing rod manufacturer. We went to Cousins, we built a full set of gear. Uh, we went to Melton's Tackle, my buddy Tracy over there, we built a full set of reels. And, and, and My boss put one of his kids through college. I'm fucking positive of it. <laughs> The yeah. amount of money he spent in that catalog, dude. Oh, a hundred percent. So we built the boat all out and I never really, I, I brought boats to Cabo as a captain, but never really done a tournament season. So we, we went down to Cabo and we, we entered the Bisbee's in 2017 and we went pre-fishing around and, and I got to meet a lot of local guys and, and, and we fished with some of my friends, some of my local friends. I, I called up my buddies down there and we, we started fishing together and we, we built a little team together. I had one of my buddies, Sam from California as my mate. I had Zach come down and, and fish with us that year too. And we went out in 2017 and, and we found a little dealio that, that seemed to be working. And I wasn't too familiar with, with, with the, the entirety of Cabo fishing. I'd never really caught a blue marlin down there. I'd just been down there to stripe fish and tuna fish, uh, but never really done a, a fall season. First year we fished, uh, we caught a, a 442 pound blue marlin on day one of the Bisbees. Uh, and we, 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 uh, and we weighed that fish. We caught on a lure right in front of the harbor. Uh, uh, but we ended up getting beat for the daily by, by a guy with like a 500 pound black marlin. Ah, so we almost, we almost made our million dollars year one. <laughs> But, oh, man, it was sad, right? And, oh, my God, we, 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 would get, we came so close. It's very rare to weigh a fish in the Bisbees. The Bisbees are not good fishing tournaments for, for numbers, right? Very rare to weigh fish in the Bisbees. So it seems like this once-in-a-lifetime deal. So it was kind of a bummer. We didn't win the million dollars, but we got fifth place. And we got our little novelty check, and we, and we got our little trophy. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is great. Felt like I, 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 I was on to, to a new experience, life-changing. So next year, we come back, same boat. Uh, and the boat's called Chinito uh, with Davis. And then uh, – so we enter the Bisbees again, uh, and we do the whole season, but the first two terms were unremarkable, and it was day three of the Bisbees, um, and, uh, and we, we, uh, we, hooked, uh, we hooked a big black marlin on a skipjack, 
Um, and we fought it for three hours and, and we, uh, we caught a 510 pound black marlin on day three with, with three days of rollover jackpots. Oh, and, uh, oh. and, we, and, we, and, we, and we won $3 million with I think $3.02 million in the Bizzies, which at oh, the time was like the second biggest uh, you know, tournament win of all time behind, uh, behind Bad Company who had, who, had, who had won a similar event with like multiple rollover jackpots. And I was like, oh my God, this is great. Obviously like life affirming, life changing. It was all you ever wanted to do was win the Bisbees. And in that year, we also, we won a tuna tournament. We won the, the Pelagic Rockstar tuna tournament that year. We had a good year. Um, and, uh, and then we came back and then I, I actually moved programs after that. Uh, I, I moved over to, uh, to a new program, the program I'm in now, the Stella June Fishing Program, which was another one of my charter clients from California. His name's Ivan. Now, Ivan, Ivan owns a marijuana dispensary called the Jungle Boys. So if you're into weed, That's... you know there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, but he's a, he's a really good fisherman, really great guy. And, and, and he gave me a good amount of autonomy to kind of, again, build out a program and build a boat. And by now with a couple of seasons, I, I fancy myself to be fairly perceptive. And I kind of knew like how we wanted to build it, but not totally yet, but we kind of knew how to build the basis point of what we were trying to do. So, so we're going to build a big center console and we're going to, we're going to take a center console and we're going to take the bay capacity of, of a big boat uh, and then combine it with the speed, agility, and stealth factor of a center console. Uh, so we did that when we, we, we built a 45 Sea Hunter with the guys out there in Florida. And we brought that boat to California and we spent like a whole year kind of dialing it in. We put a big custom bait system on it, uh, two, a tuna tubes. The first year we did not have a sonar on it, but we, we built a pretty extensive tube program, a pretty extensive you know, bait system. I think at the end of the day, like where it stands now, we have like 300 gallons of bait capacity total on that boat. So we, and we can just carry a lot of bait. Um, How's that compared to you, Nick? Uh, that's a lot. Yeah, that's a, we have a, we have a lot a, more. Oh, yeah. We have a 120 gallon center mounted tank, which is like a West Coast style tank, which are really good tanks. You, I like your guys' removable style tanks, but like on the West Coast, it's, we have these big oval center mounted tanks. So we did that and then plopped a rocket launcher on top of it. So we built that boat. We came back to the Bisbee's in 2019. And then on what was it? Day two or day three? One of those days, we, we caught another qualifier. We caught a, a 466 pound black marlin. Uh, but we lost the daily again. Uh, unfortunately, you can't win them every time. <laughs> but the team that beat us in the daily was the team that we beat for $3 million in 2018. <laughs> so it kind of seemed like it was, uh, it was, it's just how this thing works, right? I feel like it, there was an equalization uh, there. Um, and then, you know, that being a, a very good team, a very experienced team with a very good captain. Um, but we caught another nice fish. And, How'd you and catch that fish? On a, on a skipjack. A live bait program. We're a live bait program predominantly. We fish by one. That's that's just where our program has brought us. So I was stoked that we got to catch a fish from my boss in the Bisbees, uh, and 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 kind of have that concept come to fruition. I don't know if it was the first, you know, team to place in the Bisbees with the center console. I think it might have been. I might be wrong. It's possible though. Um, there's a lot of center consoles now. There's definitely been more that have been kind of built out in the same line over the last few years. But at the time in 2019, I think we had like one of the, well, there was a few, we had one of the only ones that I was fishing the Bisbees. Um, and then we, we uh, so we were stoked. So we did three years of qualifiers and we had a, a fourth, a fifth, and a first and three years in the Bisbees black and blue. And then we, uh, we also, we kind of, we won a daily in the tuna tournament that year as well. Uh, and then last year we went back down and we caught a, we caught a, a 596 pound black marlin in the Los Cabos Billfish Tournament. So we ended up catching the largest fish of that tournament. So El Sortudo, which is really a legendary team out here, they caught two qualifiers in that tournament. So they won the tournament on points, but we did catch the largest. We, we won the largest marlin jackpot and, and, and had a daily in the, in the Los Cabos Billfish Tournament, which is really one of my favorite tournaments. I really think those guys do a great job in that tournament you know, should, should be getting more and more boats every year because they do an amazing job, you know, alongside the Bisbees in Cabo. Um, uh, so we had a good year last year. Um, and we also won a, a tuna daily in that tournament as well. We ended up catching the biggest tuna and the biggest marlin of the whole season last year. Now, last year was the infamous no no qualifying fish in the Bisbee's deal. So so they've rolled over uh, they rolled over like three million dollars or four million dollars to this year. And then what do you know? This year comes around. We have a big hurricane. We had great pre fishing this year. We were on them. We were we were hooking black marlin reading right, right up to the tournament. Everything was lining up. And then right before the season started, a big hurricane came in. And just kind of blew the coast out. And, and black marlin are a shallow water fish, and we're fishing stones, we're fishing restructure. We have 800 waypoints that, that we're working with that are just small rocks and stones and, and, and high spots and edges and rips and whatever. And our, our whole grid, our whole sector just got blown to pieces. The current was pumping, it was just terrible conditions. 
uh, green water, heavy current. Uh, and once again this year, nobody really caught, uh, there was two qualifiers caught this year in the black and blue, but it was teams that weren't across the board. So they're rolling like another $3 million over to next year in the Bisbees. So next year, there's going to be like $12 million oh, next year in the Bisbees if you catch the, if, if it goes to day three with no qualifiers and somebody corks off a 500 pound fish or even a 305 pound just a, fish, yeah, it doesn't a 305 pound fish. This year, if you would have caught a 305 pound fish and been across the board in the Bisbees, you would have made like $9 million. Golly. So like, it's wow. fucking crazy, right? now. I remember, I remember when I was younger and fucking like captains when I was, when I like didn't think, or it wasn't like set stone that i was going to be like in my head that i was going to be a sport fish captain they were like oh don't be a captain you'll never you know the only only fucking millionaires or only uh only the owners are millionaires not the the captains and i'm like well that's not really why i fish but that's fucking you could end up yeah. being a fucking millionaire boat captain like overnight 100 <laughs> like, yeah, like, percent. like contractually if you catch that fish you should be getting a million dollars right? yeah so, I mean, the thing is, uh, you would hope that it's good fishing and that, you know, they catch a qualifier every day and that'll, but it'll still be like a, what, three, four million dollar dailies, which is crazy. Yeah. That's usually, that would be a full day's worth of dailies rolled over to the third day and one winner and in, in, in any other year. So it's, the stakes are super high. That's going to be crazy. Uh, unfortunately, Cabo's black brown fishery and Cabo's, you know, big fish fishery has just not been that great the last couple of years. It gets a lot of heat. It gets a lot of pressure. This year was very environmental. It was very conditional. The conditions totally fell apart, you yeah. know, and you know, when, when you're talking to some of the guys like who, who I really respect, like, you know, Steve Lasley from bad company, like some of these really legendary captains and they're kind of echoing the conditional concerns about the tournament with conditions being the way they are. And nobody's really seeing anything. And everybody's kind of a lot of good teams that are fishing down there and not a lot of, of, you know, we like, we're, we got sonars, we have good technology, a lot of good boats. Like if there's like good volume around, even if it's not bunny, you kind of see it, you know, um, just man, three days of, of really, really very low opportunity, you know, and a, and a lot of good captains, a lot of really experienced, incredible captains, guys, much better than myself who just aren't really seeing it or, or having a lot of opportunity on it. You got to just kind of shake your head. And sometimes, and you're out there in some heavy Cabo heat and not a lot of wind and sitting out there just baking in a center console. I really respect my boss because, you know, I, I think we'll be in a big boat soon. Uh, we're working on it, but you know, man, like the, <laughs> I was just going to ask you that. Are you guys, you guys have vision for a bigger boat here? hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that I, I hope that my boss is, is going to put his, 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 his vision to, to, to play soon. Um, I think we will, hopefully, uh, I'm patient, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to wait, you know, I, I really, we, we have a great program and we, uh, we, uh, we, we, we get by with our center console. And to be honest, Nick, I mean, man, I'm a fisherman first, uh, at the end of the day, I grew up fishing, skiff fishing my whole life. I don't really care. I don't need to be that comfortable. I, I've commercial fish and skiff fish my whole life. Being on a center console is, is easy on me, uh, individually. Uh, I want my boss to have AC for his enjoyment. Uh, yeah. He deserves it. Uh, but I, uh, I don't really mind too much. And you know what, to be truthful with you, I think we have very strong structural advantages to our program. And like, like I said, we put, our boats have all the best electronics in them. We built, we got 17 tubes. We have huge bay capacity. Our boats are built to compete on every technical level with a 90 footer with the advantage of being a small, silent, stealthy, small boat. And, and, and fuel we're is in the business of 15, winning tournaments, not, not showing off the size of our boat. So, and fuel uh, is $15 a gallon over there, whatever it is. Oh, no, you'll be surprised though, dude, we are dumping fuel. We only get like point, with how our boats built down now, we only get like 0.3 miles. Like it's yeah. weird. We're, we're dumping, make no mistake about it. We're burning our 100 <laughs> gallons an hour. You know what I mean? Yeah. We're dumping fuel at the back of the boat, just like these big boats are too yeah. you know there's was, challenges to, to to running a center console program like and right now we've got you know we've got four yamaha 425s we have four merc 450s and then my boat's got two mercury 300s that's 10 engines you know like yeah having two engines is a little easier than 10 engines especially when you're dealing with computers and just stuff but not we, with nick's engine room together. you know we keep <laughs> it together uh we're, we're holding it together we we uh it's uh it'll you know i i i respect i respect the uh the twin diesel configuration a great deal though and i think for certain facets of fishing you have a very defined advantage with it you know pulling dredges fishing behind the boat i still would vastly prefer a twin engine configuration to an outboard configuration yeah. but for the slow troll fishing that we do and for a lot of the front of the boat fishing that we do it's fine. I like our center consoles they've made us a lot of money so we're chilling yeah. you know <laughs> but that 40 foot cabo 
fantastic boat as well. I mean, I'd love that boat. I think a pocket sport fisher is the way to play. You don't want to, you don't want to be fishing a tournament in a 90 footer. You're insane. Yeah. What do you consider a pocket sport fisher? Like a 40 footer? I don't know. Yeah. Maybe a full, I don't know. I could be wrong about that, but I'd say maybe a 35 or 40 footer, right? Yeah. It's an objective opinion. A little compact (laughs) sport fisher. It's a small boat, you know, 35 foot Cabo. I think, I think that's called a 60 footer nowadays. I know. Dude, dude, everybody's driving. I look at the state of boat building, right? Look at It's wild. You know, like we, we said, we've been playing around with some boat designs and, and, and looking at some custom stuff. It's like, do you build an 80 footer? Do you build a 60 footer? What do you want to do? Do you want to travel or compete? I mean, anybody who's lining up to compete in a 90 footer, is at a disadvantage? I would, I, the, you know, there's, I would agree with that. You know, I, I remember when I was, I went through the Panama Canal with the Fala Me and 92 Viking. And he was like, we, we he was going to fish the list when you series and everything. And he's like, man, if, if the sailfish don't show up and the, the it's not like wide open 30, 40, 50, 50 by days, it, it's going to be okay. We can compete, get our Marlin bites and catch our, catch our sails. But if it gets to the point where like fishing's really good, he's like, we're at an extreme disadvantage, but. Yeah. Well, I've yeah. just put it this way. I'm, I'm fishing black Marlin. I'm trying to pull a black Marlin off a hundred foot stone or a little batch of hard bottom and 250 feet of water. And I'm going to park a 90 foot boat on top of a hundred foot spot. Do you think that being quiet in that aspect, in that type of fishing helps or being smaller and quieter? In a shallow water fishery for a fish that's getting chased around by a hundred boats on a heavy pressure tournament day? Absolutely. Yeah. Are you kidding? I mean, I mean, these fish like as if, as if an experienced black marlin is not, is not unaware of the fact that there's, that there's 30, I mean, there's, it's like this Cabo fisher and there's, there's spots, there's defined areas to the same way in the Gulf, there's rigs that people fish to live bait programs around. We have hard bottom and structure spots and rocky reef and such little ledges, little edges, you know, little batches of hard bottom, little funnels. And, and the idea that these fish are not at least somewhat aware that there's something different going on today than there was a week ago, you know, a bunch of people dragging around kind of odd looking skipjack on big hooks and heavy cable, you know, like it's, there's definitely an awareness there, no doubt, whether or not they care if the conditions are right and the fish is hungry. I mean, I, I, when fish want to bite fish, will fish bite. And that's the thing about like Marlin and tuna, like when, when the demeanor is right, fish will bite. And but a lot of fish are very on off predators and if they don't want to bite, they're just not going to bite. And there's nothing that you can really do to compel a bite from a fish that's not going to eat, you know? Um, but if they want to bite, they want to bite. And, and sometimes you're dealing with that middle line with fish that are probably uh, more cautious than they might normally be, but not unwilling to eat entirely. And I think that that is the middle line that most high pressure fisheries operate under, right? You have a fisheries that are not high pressure with, with fish that have really good biting demeanors and they're just going to eat the paint off everything you put behind the boat. You have fisheries where catching a fish is going to be virtually impossible under certain condition sets. And then you have the middle line that I think most competitive programs operate within. Some like your sailfish fishery, you know, the same thing where you, you still have to be focused on presentation. You still need to be having some sort of structural advantage to your team, right? So if you're curing your, your pilchards and your sardines and your bait and your, your, your little Google eyes, goggle eyes, I think we call those cabillito out here. <laughs> you're, cure, you're, 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 you're curing your Google eyes. Goggle eye, goggle eye. Ah, no, they're Google eyes. And I, I always tell Bernie, they're Google eyes. If you're curing your Google eyes for a month, like you guys like to do, clearly you have an advantage to curing your Google eyes for a month. <laughs> you know, so, um, you know, like there's things that you can do and you know that as an extremely successful captain, I mean, there's always got to be your edge, whether that edge is coming from your crew, from your boat, from your tackle, from your oh. spots or what the reality is, which is it's all those things combined. You need to find your edge. You need to find something you do exceptionally well. I'm fishing the Bisbee's black and blue. My job is equally important to catch a skipjack or a bait fish or a chewilly or a yellowfin tuna as it is to catch a black marlin. Absolutely. My day, my day starts at five o'clock AM every morning. We are the first boat out of that harbor every single morning because we are trying to fill our tubes in the dark and then i'm trying to top off my tubes real fast on the bank and get out of there my objective when i leave that shotgun start is to be the first boat on my spot every single time and the thing is i'm driving around the boat that will go 55 knots and i've got a fucking sport fisher that will go 48 knots coming right at my tail and i get there maybe five or ten minutes early but you know what i'm a live bait guy who grew up locking to schools of tuna to the boat like a commercial style and i know that having that school pinned to my corner first is an advantage and i do not want to be the last boat in there. I know that I get it clean. That means I get four or five before everybody else is. I get a whole rack of baits before anybody else gets there. I know that I have, the, I, I have domination on that spot for a few minutes and that's all it takes on half of those days for us to get in and out of there. You know, Sometimes it's a little more fickle, 
you know, but to the same degree that there's carousels of votes working on striped marlin piles up in Mag right now, there's carousels of votes trying to catch Skipjack on the Gordo and Bisbee's, you yeah. know, it's the same concept. Um, but it's a concept that I hate to be a part of. So I want to get out of there with good bait right away. Right. Uh, no, there's a lot of factors at hand. I think that, that we've done a good job building, uh, building a boat that, or a set of boats uh, that, is, that is doing really well for us within the confines of what I consider to be a tournament winning way of, of fishing right now. And, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm, again, I'm exceptionally grateful to my boss who's been really supportive and he spent a lot of time and money uh, really building the, the, the coolest boats in the world. And I'm excited for the next step, whatever it may be. Um, and uh, it's just interesting, I guess, as, as you guys are saying too, with, the, with how technology is, is coming to the game. And I mean, at what point I got to, you have to ask the question, Nick, it's like, in, in, uh, I, from a tournament sense, at, at what point, um, at what point is fishing just going to become uh, uh, like with how sonar technology is coming? I mean, at what point does fishing fail to, to, to be fishing? As it's yeah, been? yeah. I mean, who knows what the next five years is going to bring as far as technology, you know, the way it's going right now. So it's, I mean, the, yeah. will, the willingness to, I mean, it just seems the, the money that is thrown around by some of these programs yeah. is just ridiculous. And they're just like, I mean, some boats, you just, they're always in the boatyard getting another upgrade. Like, like and not like a little upgrade either like a fucking two hundred thousand dollar upgrade like it's like exactly. nothing to them and i find it really in- i'm it's kind of like i'm really happy where it is now but it, it's not going to stop you know my advice to captains and crews and i like who cares what i think right but if you're a captain and you want to win and you want to be a competitive captain then you need to spend time outside of your program fishing preferably on your own boat, preferably with just yourself or a small crew of guys. You need to make sure that you're connected with the technical aspects of rod and hand fishing and the small scale fishing that a lot of effectiveness is built off of, right? It's very easy to at times get lost and let your, your program work behind you uh, and let things just happen. And, and obviously every captain is a good captain. Every, every captain is a master of, of, of their own operation and knows how to, how to, how to, how to have their, their level of control, efficiency, or proficiency. Something that's always been really important to me uh, is to fish at, uh, on a more rudimentary level as much as you can so that you remain in touch with what it means to be a small boat fisherman, to fish without all the tools and all the craziness and all the, and all the captains. That's why I've always been somebody who advocates for small boat ownership. If you're not somebody who's fishing on your own small boat, I think that you lose a great deal of connectivity to, to what it means to be a fisherman. Skiff fishing is the basis that a lot of the best fishermen that exist in today's world and today's industry are built on the idea of the small boat angler. Somebody who does it all. Somebody who's running both captain and crew duties and angler duties. Every crew, every captain should make a point to, to bring it down to the small primitive levels of the sport so that you don't lose touch. You I know? like it. I believe I that. I, I mean, I grew up on a tiny boat. I mean, that's that's all I had. That's all I could afford. You know, that's where I started. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just so easy now. It's easy to lose touch. It's easy to lose touch. You know, and, and, uh, and, you know, when you, when you lose touch with, 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 with physically just touching the water around you, um, you lose a great deal. You lose a great deal. And it goes back to what I was saying with like the striped marlin fishing. There's something to be said for catching this fish and just actually looking at it. Right. Like, like look at the beautiful colors on this fish, touch this fish, touch this fish, understand what you're doing. You're not just jumping fish off all day. Understand what this animal is fundamentally, you know? Yeah. And, 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 and I think that's just important to keep you grounded. It's important. It's an important lifestyle thing. You know, when you're fishing, fishermen love to say that, oh yeah, we're like, we're the most connected to the ocean. And yeah, we are right. You spend your whole life, a significant portion of your, of your living, breathing existence disconnected from land. Uh, yeah. You're spending a lot of time in an environment that is, that is foreign. Right. Um, and more so, more so than that, you even, even being out there but you fucking i mean if you're in, if you're like us you're fucking thinking about this shit constantly driving down the seven. driving down the road like man like just like just the craziest thing the smallest thing you just ponder over for hours just trying to figure out how we're gonna do it better so you spend a lot of time fun. on the smallest things sometimes you got to think about the big things too <laughs> and that's what i'm saying sometimes Everybody's so obsessed with these minute aspects too. And, and, and that's really important. But sometimes like the generalized, you know, the generalized picture, just, just again, it's something so, so just so basic and easy to concept is just, is just looking at what you're catching, 
you know, yeah. just touching what you're catching. And, and, and uh, yeah, I'm not want to get too fucking s- silly with this because, but it's something that I've done more so as, so as who's been neurotic about fishing to the point where I've, where I've at times been way too intense about it and, 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 and been so wrapped up in, 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 in like, in, in managing things a certain way, or it has to be this way and there's nothing else that it can be. And you can't ever lose a fish or miss a fish. And, 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 and as somebody who, you know, like, like all captains, guys who are successful, who's, who's constantly thinking and tinkering and, and experimenting with it, um, at a certain point, like, does it sap your quality of life as a competitive angler when you're, when you're so, when you're so wrapped up in, in just, in, in winning and catching fish? Like, I always try to make a point to just go out there and just fish for the sake of fishing at times and just watch the sunset. I'm down here in Cabo. I want to go spend an afternoon on the Gordo and try to catch a tuna or a mountain or something. Go out there and, and fish with, with no stakes at all. There's no, there's no, there's nothing that necessarily has to be accomplished today other than just a little bit of general connectivity to the environment. I think it's important to ground yourself in the reasons why so many people love the ocean, which is just the fact that it's peaceful and calming and disconnected from chaos, you know? The chaos of the modern of modern society as we interacted. You guys are in Florida. Dude, I went to Florida. I was terrified for my life. All right. <laughs> I was driving up and down those freeways, terrified for my life. I was like, I have to get out of here. COVID or, or with, with the COVID craziness over there and just with, with the, the people craziness. I was out there just like absolutely terrified for my life. I'm just kidding. It wasn't that bad. But it was crazy. it's 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 Florida's an interesting place. Yeah. I was, I was tripping out. Nick, guys, you don't understand. I mean, this is coming from somebody from California. (laughs) No, 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 no. You guys guys don't understand how much crazier Florida is than California. I was staying with Bernie, all right? You guys know Bernie. Bernie. Bernie's great. Bernie was very – the hospitality was fantastic. Dude, these guys are – your lifestyle is crazy, all right? (laughs) I I get an awesome, awesome way. But I'm like, you know, I, I, had like, I come down to Cabo to decompress from both California and then with the amount of time I spent out there, I'm like, man, like this is just a fast moving, crazy place. There's just a lot going on. And like, I just turned 30 years old here like a, like a month ago and, and I've almost made a conscientious decision to, to, to spend some time like, like down in, in, a, in, in a place of peace after what's been like a really crazy like, like 20s career of fishing where it's been just very go, 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 go. And I'm happy right now because of it. Uh, and, it's, and it makes my fishing better, you know? So I so just, I don't know if oh, I said come relax like, in I, Miami. What? <laughs> come relax in Miami. <laughs> I want to you know what I, you know what I really want to do? And, I, and I'm, I'm trying to sell myself as this. I want to be a flatline angler. In the sailfish tournament, all right? I want someone to fly me to Florida and give me a little pocket conventional rod, and I just want to flatline all day. That's all I want to do. Ask Bernie. I can do it. I can make a nice cast, a beautiful cast. I caught a sailfish. He had, Bernie has this little valiant, a little tiny, like a uh, little, what's the smallest valiant in it? I don't know, 300. Yeah, you know, this little bait making rod. It's like dad's rod. It's like, yeah, you can't catch a sailfish on this thing. Caught a sailfish on that thing. I was so proud of myself. Just a little uh, We'll get you rod. over here. Oh, just beautiful. I want to see, I want to see one of those hundred foot casts. Hundred percent, no problem. That's what we live off over here. Uh, so we only we grow up fishing conventional tackle. That we have some spinning rods, uh, and we even we've been using some spinning rods just because it is fun. My boss likes using them. He can cast too, like a, like really good. And but he still likes using the spinning rods just for the challenge of doing it. But like we literally do not use spinning tackle almost at all. It almost doesn't like most of these West Coast operations don't have one on the boat. You know, it's my girl. My girlfriend, uh, she lived in, in Long Beach for a couple of years before she moved back here to, to Maryland. And uh, she, was, she was like, who are you doing the podcast with? And I was like, I don't know this guy, Evan Salve. And she looked you up and you guys have a bunch of friends in common. But when I met her, um, uh, she was telling me about that. And we, we had a conventional jigging, a, a, a jigging rod. And I was like, can you cast this? Because I've never been able to cast it. She could outcast me like, <laughs> like no, no tomorrow. She's still, I like on our personal boat, we, or, um, um, she fishes with a conventional rod and I still fish with a spinning rod. And I feel like it's a little emasculating. <laughs> my, my, my personal favorite rod that I own, it's a, it's a, it's an 11 foot solid glass rod. It's called a CUI. They don't really make them. doesn't really exist. It's literally just a 11 foot tube of fiberglass weighs like five pounds. And I fish out with a Trinidad 30 straight 50 pound mono and we catch hundred pound tuna on that thing all the time. 
literally a catch 100 pound tuna on that rod. Just, just like, that's, a, that's a long rod. Long rod. Yeah, but but I use that for, we use it to fish the we use it to cast service irons at foam. That's like a a, 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 a beach rod you're fishing off the beach. Yeah, that's surf that's literally rod, what yeah. we do. But but no, I mean I, I can I mean 150 200 feet is not really really out of the realm. You know, 100 wow. yard cast. It's pretty, 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 pretty easy to do with like a, like a couple ounces of, of, of lure, you know? So I like guess, but that's, that's how you grow up in California. It's just like, it's as, it's as, 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 as much a part of, it's probably the definitive thing about California's fishing culture is conventional reels casting off of something. Right? Well, the way you, the way you spoke about dead bait dredge fishing and absolutely then the disdain that you had. <laughs> yeah, but, but don't get me wrong. Listen, I know some of the, like the, pre, the, the premier West coast guys who love their dredge fishing and we dredge. Yeah. I have some dredges. Okay. I look at them he has a dredge. every time has I go into dredge. my garage, I, I look at them and I say like, what is this stupid looking chandelier? <laughs> <laughs> like, but not because I don't respect its functionality. No, no, no. It's because, just, like, yeah. it's just like, like to me, this represents the oppression of color. All yeah. this thing does is keep fish off my back. Yeah. And this thing is, this is an oppressive tool that keeps fish chasing my boat instead of me chasing them. I don't know. And yeah. that's probably an exaggeration yeah. because they're great, right? But, but understand what the fundamentals of dredge fishing are. It's right. You are driving in circles around a fish that is locked into a pre-existing food source, trying to transition it from real to plastic. And some of these guys are so crazy as to think that they can actually rig like dead, like natural baits under dredges. But from a, like, it, it, it's like, <laughs> I can't fathom to me why, why it would be more enjoyable to do that than it would be to just walk to the bow Catch a mackerel or that's, have a mackerel. That's, well, we don't, highly, we, that's highly frowned upon. No, yeah, they frowned against. them on for what but, we yeah. No, but we don't we don't we don't get like it's the dredge fishing is was a, a just a just was derived from simple necessity that we don't we don't we don't have that sort of fishing here on the east coast where you could just roll up like like most of our fish are, are caught what you would what, what you would consider basically blind trolling. You know, so it's but kind let of. Let me ask you: do, do, do I hate dredge fishing more than dredge guys hate live bait guys? Because in Florida, mm. they hate you guys so much they won't even let you compete against them. No, I mean, it, it, there. I mean, there's there's the line of up above Palm Beach that it, it does change. It. Uh, you guys are very discriminated against as as here, fishermen. You guys are you guys are discriminated against heavily. They, they, they and, literally exclude you guys from fishing events. I'm like, and I think that's crazy. I sit here uh, like, man. I feel like fishing should be totally a matter of preference. And if, and if you can't win, right. Doing something, then you need to adapt. Right. Like, but you should That's never, fair. ever, ever. Ex- or or they allow us the fish now, but, it, but they get, they get a uh, three they point two or one. Yeah, three like, like, what is this yeah. nonsense? You have like, see, this is tournament directors placating like old school people or lazy people who don't want to adapt. Right. But if it's truly a competitive realm, then you have to adapt. Right. If I was to, if I was in a tournament and I felt like we could not win the tournament with live bait, then I'm not going to live bait fish. And there's plenty yeah, yeah. of days that we are going to do what we need to do to compete. But I think that it, the, the other side of it, is there's days when 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 maybe based on conditions you will have an advantage doing one thing versus the other and that's a, a, a professional decision that needs to be made on behalf of crews but to 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 exclude somebody because they're they're developing a new style of, of competing and winning well that's silly if you got a oh, if, you're, if you're in a there there program, there are a hand there are a handful of virginia beach guys that are like they have you have their vote guys yeah, yeah. I just, I just, I can't fathom it. It's, it's, I think it's super silly. And I think that there's been times where some of these, like there's been this thing where, where they've been almost trying to do it on the West coast. And I think it's super whack. Don't come to Cabo and do this whole like, live bait, dead bait thing. If, if, if there's ever a tournament series that goes down for Stripe Marlin out here where all these big names come out and say, we want a tournament, we want to put $500,000 to see who can release the most Stripe Marlin a day. I have, I see the future right now. You know what they're going to do? No lie bait. And they do that. Oh, yeah. That'll be the single most ridiculous, no, they sh- they unethical, should. discriminatory, and downright wrong thing that's ever happened in the history of West Coast competitive fishing. Because that is a spitting in the eye of all the local guys who have spent their entire careers learning how to do something. And here's the thing. There are plenty of days in Mag Bay where the dredge guys are going to wipe the floor with live bait guys because the fish aren't floating, right? But when it's floating, it might equalize. And the guys are going to be able to maybe probably do better with the live bait, but there's an equalization that happens over the course of many days where you have to know how to do both, but you have to be accepting as both as well, because if you're not doing both, then you're literally putting yourself at a, at a, at a, at a disadvantage. And this is a sport of fishing, right? 
where, where, where part of being competitive, it's not just like throwing up your good day numbers, it's being consistent year round. So consistency comes from adaptability and adaptability takes effort, right? And if you're gonna like do, if you're gonna enter into a foreign fishery, then yeah, you should probably see what the heck is actually going on within the scope of your foreign fishery that you just entered in. But listen, I'm not even going to go too deep into that because we also have things that we do really well out here that I'm going to protect. I don't want to talk about all the things that we do. And there's a lot of subtleties to how we're fishing that you're just not going to get unless you fish with us because it's just, it's just too ingrained in what we're doing. And, and it's just a methodology that guys aren't going to want to do. If you've spent your whole life perfecting a dredge program, then you're going to hate sitting in the gyros all day. You have to spend oh, years, years convincing yourself to sit in a pair of binoculars all day, right? You're going to have to spend years wanting to, wanting to fish off the bow before you, before you want to fish off the bow. But then you see guys like Bad Company, right? You know Bad Company, Anthony Shea, big, big West Coast team, one of, the, one of the famous West Coast teams. So Anthony went up there a few weeks ago and they did good numbers. They, they hold the record, the, the record, so to speak, of, uh, for the most fish. I think they did that last year, right? They went up there mm -hmm. with, the, with Anthony's fleet on Bad Company and they did it all on the bow. God, you we know? got to get that guy on here. Anthony's great. Well, see, the thing about Anthony is, is listen, Say what you want to say about, about that program and, and, and how crazy it is. But Anthony's actually like, if you watch that guy fish, that's an owner, billionaire, a lot of really good boats, but that's an owner who can fish. Yeah, this yeah. Guy, this guy and he's fucking brother. into it. Like, he's, he's, into it. he's into it. You know, it's not, he, he only, well, I, I've never met the guy, never said a word to him, but I mean, he just loves boats and fishing and the whole, whole deal, you know, and, you know? Make no mistake about it, a Anthony Shea, for, for, for no matter what you think about the program, no matter what you think East Coast versus West Coast stylistically, is one of the best owners in the game right now at fishing because of his adaptability, because he knows how to do it all. Because Anthony will walk to the bow with Steve Lasley at the helm, who's the, you know, Steve's pretty much considered to be the best, you know, on the West Coast is for, for American you know, captains on the West coast, right. Just ex experience wise. And really just a great, really nice guy you know, that duo. Like these guys have caught a lot of swordfish and a lot of really challenging service caught fish casting at them. The, the guy can take like a, like a, a, a you know, a 50 sized reel or a 30 sized reel with, with, with heavy, with heavy string and, and make a really, really good clean cast at a service finning fish, which is something that a lot of guys like just are just cannot fathom doing and just cannot do. And because he can do it, he gets to engage with surface caught swordfish, which is something that's again, very unique to the West coast fishery. Right? So to the same degree that, that there's a lot of West coast owners that maybe are not going to be as good at the bait and switch fishing, or maybe are not going to be as good at, as, as the dredge fishing just by nature of how they grew up fishing and, and by nature of day spent doing something. There's, there's, there's a lot to be said for, for West coast philosophy. The best, uh, the best operations in the world are always going to be the operations that can pull the good off anywhere they go and add that into their repertoire, you know, adaptability. Well, but yeah, it's, it's also fishing intelligence. It's fishing intellect. And yeah, fishing man. intellect is super important if you're trying to make money, right? If it's a profession. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's cool. It's just, it's just fishing, right? It's just going out there and, and banging on a fish and banging on a fishery and just see, seeing, seeing what you can find. I think it's been fascinating. I, I, listen, I'm not, I'm not like, I'm not a fishing fanboy, but, but listen, Carulo, bro. I always say, I'm like, I have my joke with Bernie. I'm like, bro, I want to hang out with Nick because you're kind of famous. I'm just saying, but, but, I'm, I'm, but I'm just lucky to be here with the man. Like I just, I think he's, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm, dude. I, just, I don't know you as well. Cause you, cause your name hasn't popped up in my circle. So uh, I don't mean it as, I'm not down. No, no, no. No, nah, no, nah, he's the man. Because I look at, but I also know something. I know that you being a successful up and coming younger guy in a fishery that is comprised of a lot of guys who've been doing it for several decades longer. I know how it is, right? Like you got to have your edge. You're doing well. You found a niche that you can operate within right now. That's been really successful for you. Right. But the thing is people can hate on success, but I think it's super silly to do that because the, the next journey is finding the next niche, all right? You can either try to, to emulate the success that you're having, or you can start working on the next enhancement within your program. And if you look at fishing, you can say, oh, it's all over and all the advancements are over, but probably not. There's probably something that'll come along that'll be pretty hot for a little while, a methodology or a way of fishing. Might take decades for it to emerge. Fishing might have to change dramatically within a fishery for it to become apparent. But, but it always happens. There's always advancements. And the people who are successful are the people who can capture their moments, right? Find your niche, own your niche. 
you have to have an edge. Anybody competing needs to have an edge, something that they do better or at least very well as opposed to everybody else around them. Because otherwise you're just operating off of luck. You're operating off blind luck. I think that competitively on the West Coast, I'm fishing against probably 20 other teams that are doing well within the niche that I choose to operate in. And when I say doing well, I'm not saying that outside of that 20, they're not doing well, but these are the teams that are very, very, very committed. 10%. 10% of the boats catch 90% of the fish. It's just a way of just got to figure out how to be one of this 10%, you know? Yeah. And I wouldn't be so, 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 so arrogant or so blind as to say that every single one of those captains who are running a boat in a, in a big money term, everybody out there is qualified for a reason. Everybody out there is, has, has made some sort of commitment to this profession, right? To get to that point, you have some sort of commitment. People are paying money for you to be there. But in today's day and air and age, there's there's a driving force that's going to compel a team to win consistently and it's not just a single captain or a single set of gear it's it's a it's a combination of ideologies you have to have an owner a crew and and a captain and then you have to combine that with with relevance within within these niches and in an understanding of these niches and and that's what you're going to build your winning programs off it's it's got to be a combination of things and it's just people lose touch people fall off. And it's not that they fall off because they haven't seen a lot of things. It's not that they don't know. It's because one of those things fall off, right? Mm -hmm. Or a couple of those things fall off, or maybe they've just put a few too many decades and they don't need to work as hard and they just don't care about winning as much anymore. And you know what, within the scope of their journey, that's a totally acceptable answer. And it's a totally acceptable thing because you know what, you find a boss who just wants to finish and have fun and you're going to be totally fine and well taken care of all the best captains are going to have periods where they're going to go super hard and then maybe some periods where their program scales back a little bit and they maybe do something a little different that's super normal within the sport of fishing you have a good five six year run you go really hard in the paint you want to take a little bit of time off then you choose a little time to take off you know uh, but all that comes together into a multi-decade, multi-dimensional, you know, growth period that's going to basically mold you into a captain that's either really respected in your industry or somebody who just kind of like just, you know, took the paycheck and, and that's how it is, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, we all know how it is. People say what they're going to say online. People will, people, people in, in today's day and era, you almost have to lobby for your own respect within the social media spheres. I had the social media game. I played it for a long time. I've got my 20K followers, but you know what? I haven't posted (laughs) in over a year. You know why? Because I found that I fish better outside of that element of pressure. I felt like, you know what? I'm sure it'll be a point in my life where there's going to be a lot I want to say, but I don't necessarily want to feel the pressure to say it every single day. Sometimes I just want to exist for, for, for a tighter thing. You know, maybe I just want to fish for myself for my boss and for a tighter aspect of, 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 of my interpersonal community. And it's a lot of pressure nowadays to balance professional responsibilities with, with social media. If you're a captain who's so wrapped up and posting in the middle of a tournament or something, I think you're, you're, you're detracting to an extent from, from, from the effort that you can place elsewhere. And I think it's, a, it's, it's always one of these things like, hey, it's 10 minutes before the start of a tournament. The last thing I'm thinking about right now is putting a, a social media story up. I simply don't have time. We're checking yeah. over our skip and making sure we're ready to go. Yeah. We don't have time. You know what I mean? Yeah. So for me to be super, super engaged, I think that there might be a time where I return to that sphere, maybe with the right opportunity. I think there's a lot of cool stories to tell every single day, but I've also made a choice for this period of my life after over a decade of social media exposure. And we grew up in like our, our generation, we're kind of like this interesting generation that's both had social media and has had no social media, right? Mm-hmm. So we both were able to, 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 to go to school where we had to call our friends on a landline. Yeah. And then we went to school where you had a cell phone or an iPhone in your pocket. So we operate this interesting generation where we've seen both ends of that spectrum. So when you know what it's like to live both softly and loudly, both with a lot of exposure or not a lot of exposure, then, then you can kind of float between those two things. I almost feel bad for the people who grow up below us and they don't necessarily know what it's like to have that choice. You yeah. know, it's a lot harder to make a choice that you've never been able to touch before. Yeah. You know, I hear you. All right. Well, let's, it's been awesome, but let's cut it. I don't know. Hopefully this is one of our longer ones, but hopefully people. Still this is love definitely it. the longest one, but <laughs> we had, we, we were the fucking philosopher here. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I, I, I actually have loved talking to you guys and I'm no, sorry. No, it's I'm been like, awesome. Too much, no, no, it's been, you know? no, it's been awesome. No, you, and you brought up some you great points. It would be so cool. I'll be there on Friday. All right.
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give you your number, my number when it's over. Come fish. I got my boat in the water, and I would love uh, to keep fishing. I'm basically flying in, rolling yeah, up. Yeah, whatever. Bag. Stay an extra day. <laughs> but, dude, yeah. my, my, par- my dad will be there. My parents will be there for a little bit longer. So You know what I want to do? I want to I wanna break your back on my center console, and then you can go recover. <laughs> dude, it's not like I've never fucking – dude, I grew up on a 32 32- – I, I grew up on a boat that would beat your fucking brains out up here in the mid-Atlantic going fucking 90 miles know, all, with my drunk-ass <laughs> uncle. I'll make you oh, he's not uncle. drunk I'll anymore. I'll drop buddy. off in Mag Bay, but just can you have this boat carry a bladder for me? I need a feel. Yeah. <laughs> no, you can, I can get a feel. Of it. I wanna, I'm actually going to probably bring my conch up to Mag before the season's over. And I am weather windows. I want to go up there for a couple days because it's cool. Yeah. I haven't, it, we, we don't get to spend too much time in Mag. Uh, right now because we're a center console program and just, you know, it's you know, sleeping on the boat day in and day out. We, we focus our efforts closer to, uh, we've been focusing our efforts closer to Cabo, which is good for development because it's allowing to put a lot of time in, in the local water and just compile information and waypoints and just, just uh, do, yeah. do, 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 do due diligence in your backyard. But on a center console, the one drawback is we don't get to do the extended traveling trips at the Mag. But I fished a bunch of Mag, you know, in years prior. So we've had plenty of good fun up there. The guys who are coming out here are very lucky. Make no mistake about it. Cabo is one of the best fisheries on earth still, even with the pressure it gets. The West Coast is very unique. It's very special. We're all very lucky. If you're a program that's lucky enough to travel the world fishing, then absolutely you want to come out here and experience it. And I think the, the idea now is maintaining that experience and the uniqueness of that experience and learning lessons from a lot of good fisheries that have maybe had their fisheries fluctuate under the weight of heavy exposure and heavy pressure. It's a question of responsibility and protecting something that's almost uh, universally unique. There's nothing like it in the attainable world right now, right? There's probably, there's places where it's really cool like this, but this is the, the perfect confluence of attainability and accessibility and, and, and just really special unique fishing. So the impetus is on the anglers, the owners, the captains and the crew to protect something and make sure that it gives us seasons and seasons and seasons of fun, you know? Yeah. yeah. So that's awesome, the word. Bro. Bro. Well, thanks cool for joining way. us, man. It's been awesome. All right. My pleasure. Hope and, we can do uh, it again. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get out there and come fish with you, bro. I appreciate your time. It. All right, brothers. Thank you so much. All right, bro.